I'm Ritika Juneja, fellow at ICRIAR, and I'm delighted to conduct proceedings of today's event. Please join me to welcome our esteemed chief guest, Honorable Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs, Srimati Nirmala Sita Ramanji. Ma'am, it is our honor to have you with us today. We would like to begin today's conference with candle lighting ceremony. May I request Honorable Minister Ma'am, distinguished panelists and moderators to please come forward and light the lamp. Yes, ma'am. Tamso ma jyotir gamya, which means from darkness lead me to light, light of knowledge and purity. Thank you all. In addition to the August gathering here, let me take this opportunity to also welcome our online guest. About 300 participants are attending the conference digitally, and we are also streaming live on YouTube. I would now like to request our director and chief executive, Mr. Deepak Mishra, to give his welcome remarks. Hello and good morning, everyone. Her Excellency Finance Minister Srimati Nirmala Sitaramanji, distinguished panelists, ladies, and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to today's conference on taming inflation. It's a hybrid event. As we heard, there are more than 300 folks who have joined us online. So I'd like to welcome them all to this event as well. Until very recently, policymakers and economists around the world thought they found the magic wand to tame or control inflation whenever it appears. So the current episode of unprecedented worldwide inflation has taken many analysts by surprise. With hindsight, we can blame it all on excessive fiscal stimulus, extra commodity monetary policy, disruption to global supply chains, and geopolitical events like Russia and Ukraine war. But the truth is, many economists and policymakers, if not all, got it wrong. They didn't anticipate this massive bust of inflation that has now swelled the world economy. The puzzle gets even deeper because Indian economy has been subject to some of the same shock 
as the rest of the world, and yet our inflation is much lower. In fact, in my professional career as economist, I've never ever experienced this of having India having a lower inflation than many of the advanced economies for a sustained period of time. All these issues provide a perfect backdrop for today's conference. ICRIA has been a long tradition of working with monetary and fiscal authorities in India to explore macroeconomic questions like the one we will be discussing today. Our agriculture team led by Dr. Ashok Gulati works closely with RBI to track food price inflation. Our growth employment and macro team is working on comparing macroeconomic conditions in G20 countries and their implications on growth, jobs, and inequality. Therefore, it's a matter of huge pride and privilege for us that Her Excellency Finance Minister agreed to deliver the inaugural address at today's conference. Ma'am, we know how busy you are these days with the preparation for the G20 presidency, upcoming budget preparation, and just the general economic management of the country. So a big thank you to you for taking time from a busy schedule to speak to us. We also have a fantastic set of panelists, not one, but two sets of panelists to help us unravel the mystery of the global and Indian inflation story. I'm looking forward to a highly insightful and informative discussion during these two sessions. So thank you for your attention. Let me invite Dr. Ashok Gulati to give his introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak, and Honorable Finance Minister, Srimati Nirmala Sitharamanji, distinguished panelists, and all those who have come and all those who are online to listen to some words of wisdom. My job here is to give you a little background about what this conference is about. As Deepak said, the world is struggling to control this inflation and so is India. But the real challenge is not just controlling inflation, but keeping the growth intact and high. That's the real challenge, the calibration that has to take place. What we know, this world had gone through three major shocks. The COVID, the conflict, Russia-Ukraine, and also the climate change, the heat wave that is even now going around the world. Hopefully, COVID is behind us in most of the countries. China is still struggling on that and therefore their growth forecast is coming down globally. We, were, we suffered from that with negative rates of growth, as we all know. And then the entire world in a very synchronized manner decided to give a huge stimulus. And one of our presenters, Ranjana, would give you a little backdrop of what the numbers were of that stimulus. And when too much money is pumped into the system and the supplies have not boosted enough, then the net result in a traditional theory was always inflation. Are we out of the conflict situation? Perhaps the Ukraine-Russia thing is within control, but we are not sure if there are other hotspots where conflicts can emerge, which can be even more destabilizing to the world economy than what we are witnessing today. Climate, the heat wave as on today, and what happens in India, we were just talking about what is happening in Bengaluru. Excessive rain at one side and then three or four states of India are literally facing a drought situation. And if it rains too heavily, when people were talking of Bengaluru, I was thinking of Kolar, which is the biggest place for tomato markets, the largest market of India. And if you recall in June, the inflation rate in tomato was 158%, contributing 8% to the overall CPI inflation. How do we control that? And this climate change, the intensity and the frequency is likely to be more of extreme events. 
Can we tackle all this with monetary policy, fiscal policy, or do we need some other a combination of good strategy on the production side, on the stocking side, on the processing side, which are medium term? But trade policy in the short term can help us. Now, how do we play this trade policy game? So this question of inflation, whether only RBI alone can tackle where the jurisdiction really lies. I wish the governor and deputy governor Michael Patra were here, but uh, today they are in Basel for central bankers meeting. They have sent a strong team of nine people right here. And uh, City will be talking about uh, what they can do. <laughs> we have been fortunate working with RBI, Madam, on this, uh, on short-term forecasting for the last two years of different commodities, particularly the agriculture ones. There are good signs that it can come down, but there are some question marks and uncertainties still on the table. And we would love to hear from you and the panelists who have the longest experience in the corridors of finance and uh, uh, global experience. Uh, we have uh, uh, people from Monetary Policy Committee also and uh, you know, uh, private sector and media and all those. So we would love to hear from you and the uh, distinguished panelists what the policy solutions could be for India, especially for one unique thing that I want to put on the table for you. Madam. India is very unique compared to all the major countries that we compare ourselves with. Because our food is 45.86% in the CPI basket. Whereas all our peers are 8 to 15, 20% maybe. And our food, the base is 2011 12. I think we need an immediate, perhaps, revision on that and how to challenge, uh, how to cope with this challenge of food uh, inflation, which hits the poor and the vulnerable even much more. Uh, that is something on the table for us. So we have two panels, one learning from the uh, peers and the other global leaders, what they are doing and what India can learn from that. That's the first panel. Uh, the second panel is specifically on India, going into granularity of it and each of the commodities, how to tackle that uh, with uh, different hybrid policy. Thank you very much, and I'm grateful to you. And I also hear Maithili said, I'll come, it's Onam. So it's coming to the last day of Onam, right? She said, Sadia, unless you serve me, Sadia, I'm not going to come. So wishing you all the best, and uh, look forward to your uh, inaugural interview. Thank you very much, sir. I would now like to request Honorable Minister Srimati Nirmala Sitaramanji to give the inaugural address. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm firstly very grateful to Professor Ashok Gulati for having thought it fit that. Uh, I should join this gathering, especially when you're talking on things which are going to be setting certain yardsticks for measuring performance in economy, not just for India, but also uh, where you're uh, critically um, appraising countries and the way in which they've handled the economy, particularly through the inflation management uh, Prison. So it gives me great honor to be here, and I feel very humbled to be standing in front of all great scholars. And I personally do remember uh, that one instance very long ago when I was a member of the National Commission for Women, and the commission was looking at gender budgeting. And for some reason, that the chairperson then had thought I should be working on it as a member. Uh, it is a practice in the commissions that they assign the members with some tasks and uh, 
gender budgeting from among the many other things which were assigned to me was one of the things I had the rest of the commission also cooperating with me. And in that context, I don't know if Professor, Professor Shankar Acharya remembers, had gone and seen him to take his advice. And since then, uh, occasionally, at least whenever I've had the opportunity to benefit from his advice, I've valued every bit of it. So uh, today, to be again in front of him, also Rakesh Mohanji, it's, uh, it's not uh, going to be easy for me. It's, uh, it's as good as me, my first day in JNU, and uh, take me for all uh, the errors and the omission commissions that I might post before you. I still remain a student of economics. Uh, but what probably can uh, be drawn from uh, the things that I say here would be like a process documentation of what has happened to the Ministry of Finance for the last two, three years, more than me formulating anything before this August gathering. I was uh, very much in uh, alignment with uh, Deepak Mishra talking about how the world has faced situation and also Ashok Gulati, with whom one or two times before and during the pandemic also, I've had an occasion to talk about the performance of Indian agriculture and the policies which have to be uh, kept in alignment so that it uh, enables rather than restricts agriculture sector. I start with saying, I think the days that we are living in today particularly post the pandemic, are so different from the days of immediately after the Great Depression. So if, if there is a mindset somewhere which tells us handling inflation will have to be very similar to the way in which inflation was handled then because the formulations have evolved from there, I think the evolution of handling inflation has evolved drastically differently in the last four, five years. So till before, let us say, the COVID, if still some shad shades of that principle of handling inflation in a particular fashion pervaded our policy making, I like to place it on record here that COVID, during COVID and immediately after COVID and till today, Handling inflation has become only a subset of handling the economy. That over dominant control inflation, so you'll be able to control everything else as a fallout, is no longer, if I can say it with a bit of a cheekiness, is no longer relevant. You need to worry about inflation, yes. But if you look at the context in which we are talking about inflation, particularly since 2020, there are so many different factors. If you address each, address each one of them for what they are, inflation is expected to fall in place. Is the experience of at least India, I'm not speaking for many other countries. So what are the factors which are so different for India as different from what is being practiced elsewhere? I'll just highlight may not be a perfect uh, assumption for a study of how India handled differently. Because we are li living in a, a global situation where inflation is 79% in one country. Another way it is 8%, but still very critically to be analyzed, especially in the way in which the composition of the CPI is in some of the Western countries, which you, uh, Professor Gulati, rightly highlighted. So with all that, when you're looking at the, the world around you, where today we are far more integrated globally, not integrated during the third, um, immediately after the Great Depression, the globe was not so well interconnected. But today we are far more interconnected. So the, the, as the pandemic spread, the inflation impacts also spread 
will be the right assumption to hold. And it does to an extent. But actually speaking, when central banks, and I thought it was only Sita Kanta here, but it's an overwhelming presence and I dare speak on something to do with monetary policy as well. So when uh, the central banks are deciding in a synchronized fashion to handle the inflation, monetary policy is their domain, they will do it, I leave it there, but when they're acting in synchrony, it pleases the economists to know that yes, the synchrony is what is required and therefore it's right, let it go on like that, that's the solution or that will bring the solution. Immediately for me, the question is, synchrony was there, synchrony continues, synchrony is to continue as per theory, then why would some country which is well in that network have a 79%? And why some country which is the fountainhead of such theory have an inflation which is highest in the last 40 years? And why would other members of that clique of nations, I'm using the word clique with responsibility, it, uh, with responsibility and it's not left-handed at all, because in India we use cliques with a bit of a... So countries belonging to that clique are also in 8 9%, Germany 9% is as good as Turkey is 70%. It pinches, it hurts. And solutions there, therefore, by the theory, will go through only the interest rate route. So why is India different and why we are talking about it? Even in this interconnected world, even when the interconnectivity is far more pronounced nowadays, Indian economy has, for other reasons, kept managing inflation as not merely a monetary exercise. Partly what explains that is what Professor Bulati said a minute ago. If the global disruptions because of supply chain and other things are bothering every economy today, inclusive of us, Purely what is endemic, purely what is within India is the monsoon and the vagaries of monsoon, which has always kept us on our toes about supply chains. And which have kept us on our toes um, on uh, the supply chain related. What supply chain? You, I've been saying and I'm saying, you'll surely point out to me, what supply chain? You're saying India earlier was not so interconnected globally. The depth to which our economy was connected was not at all as much as it was uh, for the other countries. And since after 91 too, the interlinkages took their own steady time and probably we are far more connected now. So what lessons am I deriving from earlier when we were not connected? That's a lesson which has helped us even today. And that lesson is the one which comes out of the monsoon vagaries, the climate vagaries, not as a result of the climate change, which is happening in a far more pronounced way now, but India has had several agroclimatic zones, each one suffering or benefiting from the changes which happen because of good monsoon, poor monsoon or excessive monsoon. So our supply chain, especially when your CPI is 45% with food, is so de dependent on the basic agro products, perishable products, which are so required for the bulk of the population, which has to have it at a certain price or below it. So the affordability point has always worried Indian policy makers and the inflation obsession was only to manage those perishable goods from the supply chain point of view to make sure the poor don't suffer, suffer because of either shortage and therefore as a result of that shortage, a spike in the price. So governments have always spent a lot of time making sure onions are available, tomatoes are available, potatoes are available adequately so that the poor who depend on this 
because don't they depend on cereals? Yes, they do. But that is anyway given through the pediatrics. So you're managing the food supply for the bulk of the population in a country which still has a huge diversity in the income or the disparity in income. So inflation management from this kind of a perspective has always guided India and you're consistently, and in, in fact, I would say probably the system has been uh, evolving and given itself some kind of a framework which operates each time. And I wouldn't say comfortable framework, but a frame framework nevertheless, so that you know what happens when monsoon fails in some district where crops suffer, in some other districts where there is excess crop. And also this uh, uh, test which happens from policy makers, the balancing that you're expected to do. Because you have a vocal urban population, a vocal middle class, even if they're not in urban areas, which constantly pillory gums, and probably rightly so, for making food grains or perishable edibles or even basic essentials, which even can be under the FMCG, beyond their purchasing capacity or beyond the price at which they are comfortable with. So that pillaring happens equally at the very same time. The concern that the farmer should get the right rate for his products. So you're looking at India for every agroclimatic zone for the products which come out of there, adding to the larger national pool, and equally, therefore, making sure the farmer gets his due when uh, he should. And when the farmer gets his due, it should spike the price for the consumer. So the Indian policymaker, much before the global disruptions happened, much before the deep global interlinkages happened, much before the war happened in Ukraine, much before the COVID, had gone through this drill year after year after year. So you knew these kind of disruptions are the ones which you have to be ready to face. So you create a buffer stock. You make sure there is an MSP. You also make sure that the storage capacity for perishable are in situ at the same time appropriate for each of the crops. All, on all these measures, the government has been working absolutely one after the Atmanirbar announcements in the midst of the pandemic also gave focus to creating capacities in villages. And there, the capacities are not being uh, parachuted there. Local capacities are being created with local farmer FPOs, with NABAD going there and giving money and making sure even organization like the Baba Taumik Research uh, Center is brought in to do something as regards um, Allah, uh, uh, permitted levels of radiation to protect crops or uh, perishable commodities from perishing too quickly so that they can be stored for some time. So all this happens. And we, I, I'm very glad to say here, the prime minister himself sits in each one of these meetings. Professor Gulati would have been there to make sure that storage, distribution, and that is why the logistics thing is also very important. I'll underline the fact that even during the pandemic, farmer trains were brought in so that commodities, agricultural produces, which are uh, grown very well in some products, uh, some regions are transported very well quickly before perishing at affordable rates. And the train comes from those destinations directly to the markets, such as Mumbai or Delhi, where it is required. So um, the long and short of this side of the inflation management is looking at solutions which are going to ensure steady supply of food products, pretty perishable products, which constitute 45% of a CPI. Now, when you talk of inflation, therefore, Inflation, when uh, in 2014, uh, we formed the government, I think the inflation was somewhere at 5.9 kind of level. 
it, that kind of uh, level or somewhat below it, it came down to 3.4 sometime later. That level continued to be relevant till about 2019-20. 18-19 uh, was the time when it was at 3.4. And even after that, it continued at that level, roughly at that level till 1920. It was only after that, COVID, post-COVID, it had gone up. And therefore, the discourse is, will you contain it within the tolerance band, plus two? Here in India, again, as different probably from many other countries, the inflation that prevails in different parts of the country despite the GST, despite creation of one market, despite removing the toll taxes, freeing movement of goods vary from state to state. Now, I'm not doing politics here, but I will bring in an element where you might suspect I'm bringing politics, but it has definite relevance for the inflation, people who are studying inflation. At a time when global fuel prices went up, you wanted to be sure that that burden is not passed on to the end consumer. Where it was possible and how much above was possible, the government twice reduced the price of petroleum products to the extent it can be done. Now, very recently, Widely available information in the public domain shows how inflation has varied from state to state. There could be several reasons for it, and I'm sure you're the expert who will study it. But the fact remains, and I find coincidentally, and I'm being careful here, coincidentally, inflation being higher than the national level inflation in states which have not reduced the fuel price. You might think I'm uh, stating the obvious, but it establishes the fact that the movement of food grains and food related items actually has a bearing on the price uh, of such items, which again, I repeat, constitute a bulk of our CPI. Now, if states and their Inflation will also have to be attributed to the government of India. They will have to have a way in which we work together to handle inflationary matters with center and state cooperating. Just as today, there are a lot of discussions about devolution of taxable revenues. So based on the Finance Commission's criteria, you distribute. And even on that, there is a lot of discussion saying it is not fair. The formulation is not fair to some of the states which contribute a lot more to the revenue kitty. Similarly, there are, I would suggest, enough justification to have this understanding of how states also manage handling their inflation. It cannot be that the inflation is handled only by the center. And when states don't take enough steps, that part of India suffers for want of a relief from the stress of inflation. The exogenous factors affect both center and state. And that is where I draw your attention to the fact that if I've elaborated so much on the food, supply of food grains, perishable goods, I also draw your attention to the fact that India's medium and small industries, micro, medium, small industries, and their raw materials are very important. And actually the price of the raw materials, particularly after, let us say, a decade of having imported absolutely at throwaway prices, the MSMEs were suffering because of the supply chain disruptions. 
because of the way in which within India, essential raw materials, commodities were not being available. And that's when India or government of India made sure that at least the critical raw materials such as steel, iron and steel, we will bring in some export duties so that the price comes down and it has shown a positive result. We could keep the price of steel in India in a way affordable for the MSMEs. But of course, equally, as I said about the farmer and the consumer here too, there is a balance which have to, has to be struck on the steel industries and their potential to export, earn profit out of it. We want exports to grow in every sector. Now we are restricting them from exporting by imposing a tax which makes them cost not so competitive. But the balance therefore is to what extent would you restrict? Will it actually have a bearing on the raw materials uh, availability for our MSME? Farmer consumer MSME versus the export potential of industries such as steel. So again, in the Atmanirbhar policy and actions which followed, we have justified it from the point of view of duties where India, duties, duties on import where India produces those commodities, those products. Duties on final consumption goods, which we cannot afford because they eat into our labor, which can be engaged to manufacture those. Duties definitely on those which can be mined and value added within India. So the import restrictions had a logic. They were not blind. They were not blindly imposed. Similarly, the export constraints which we brought in were again trying to make sure the supply and demand balance happens. You don't export away something and then import it again, causing double whammy. So the Atmanirbhar principles, in a way, are also a very powerful tool in managing, managing the supply chains and therefore indirectly having a bearing on the inflation itself. I did uh, clearly say that the monetary policy and its focus on inflation control has been very sacrosanct, has been going through decades, evolving through decades. And at one point in time, we thought that is the solution for containing inflation. I say it with a certain sense of responsibility. Yes, it is one of the tools. But sometimes, like for instance, in India, leave the policy makers, if you were to talk to people who are on the ground, who are actually the stakeholders of the Indian economy, they would say, particularly in a situation where we are in now, where economic growth will have to be unfettered the IMF might periodically bring down growth, global growth, because of the way in which the war has affected them, the way in which the Russian supply of fuel, gas is hitting European uh, countries. The monetary policy has its space. Before I come back to that, I would want to add one more. I did talk about the perishable consumer versus farmer. I did talk about the MSME for the raw material with the steel as an example. I want to bring in one more example again, that which we have consciously done in the last, let us say, eight, nine months. And drawn from the experience of last two years. India imports more than 80, 85% of all its crude. We have oil wells in the Godavari Basin. We have in Barmer. We have a lot of natural gas also being 
explored, but we import more than substantial amount of food. There was a time, of course, in 2020, when the prices of global crude went down, went down, and went down uh, remarkably. And using that as an example, there are still arguments against our government's decision saying, at that time too, you didn't give the advantage of you know, cutting down the price for the end consumer. You kept the tax at a certain level. And even today, uh, very uh, adolescent, like amateurish uh, allegations are leveled against the government saying, oh, you collected so much. If it were to be parliament now, I would say collected and kept to where. But I know I'm not in the parliament. But collected. Collected for what? And how did the capital expenditure of this government perform between 19 to today? Please have a look. The data is before you. Every budget we present the uh, documents to sh show how budget was utilized uh, department-wise. So yes, when the price went down significantly, immediately we didn't give it to the end consumer to say you pay one rupee because it, it was almost like coming to pay nothing. It was going into the negative terrain. The government, of course, at that time immediately made sure that the strategic reserves were filled up, brought in fuel, and made sure that infrastructure expenditure would be given a uh, revving up. Infrastructure expenditure has been very high from 20 and had a 34% annual growth each year. This year having reached about seven and a half lakh crores. These are not possible without the government taking advantage of some of the global developments. And if I say taking advantage, it is not taking advantage to support my family or somebody else's family, the kitty with which you're able to spend on infrastructure. And why am I making spending on infrastructure so very important when we're talking about inflation? Asset addition, building of assets is one very noble objective, which all of you all will agree. But equally, when money reaches in situ, when you're creating these assets for the people who are working there, it gives money in their hands. And both short-term and long-term put together, short-term and medium-term put together, the multiplier is somewhere in the range of two rupee 45 paisa for every rupee spent. Whereas if I were to not spend on infrastructure and give it directly in the hands of the people, my multiplier is less than a rupee. 0.99. And therefore, the when the crude oil prices went down and we realized that we could fill up a strategic reserve and also make for some infrastructure monies which can be spent, it had a it had an effect on the economy both during the COVID and after that during the economic revival. The Agri Infrastructure Fund, which was part of that cess, which was the, the excise duty that was being collected, has come off handy. Today, we are able to give every APMC up to two crores of rupees each to improve your infrastructure. And really, one lakh crore has been allocated for that purpose. Any number of APMCs can apply, they will get it. Is that possible without government raising revenue? Where does this money go? This is where it goes. How does that help inflation? When your infrastructure in the ground is improved, the same farmer is able to find better market access. And with that market access, he earns more for himself because the product goes where the price is right for him. So that phase of crude oil 
buying of fruits, supplying and making sure the economy also benefits is seen through this route. But today when we are, since March, since February of this year, in a situation where global prices were going beyond anyone's affordability. And we take the call in November once and again in April, I think, or early June of reducing the price to some extent. Of course, it can't be as much as each one of us would want it to be. And at that stage, to take a very strong political decision I respect the Prime Minister for his courage on this. Get it from Russia. Get it from Russia because they are willing to give you at discount. And how speedily did we ramp it up? Where we were otherwise our entire import otherwise had only 2% or probably sometimes even lesser than 2% of Russian component into our crude basket, it was ramped up to almost 12 to 13 percent, all within a couple of months that we are talking about. And why? Why do we need to? Yes, we've cut down the price somewhat, but can it be further strengthened? Can the burden on the Indian exchequer for having to import that much more at that much more price? Can it be handled with a lot more sense of prudence? Will there be a political implication on it? Will there be a political fallout because of that? And that's where I give credit to the statesmanship of the Prime Minister to make sure globally that we did keep our relationship with all countries, but yet managed to manage till today, manage to get the Russian fuel, which is what Japan is doing today which is what probably Italy and some other countries are doing. So sanctions, sanctions, wherever they are, sanctions. But countries are finding their own way to get that very Russian fuel, Russian gas. That also is a part of the inflation management. And therefore, I just want to ensure Come back to the point which I left halfway, monetary policy. Reserve Bank will have to synchronize somewhat. May not be as much synchronized as the other Western developed countries would do. I'm not prescribing anything to the Reserve Bank. Let me be careful here. I'm not giving any forward direction to the servant. But it is the truth that India's solution to handling the economy, part of which is handling inflation also, is an exercise where the fiscal policy together with the monetary policy has to work. It can't be singularly left to the monetary policy which has proved totally ineffective in many countries, in, in very many countries which, whose structures, whose economy, whose economy's profile are so forming the basis for the monetary policy theory to revet everything on interest rate management and say that's the final and potent tool to manage inflation. Economies are designed, I mean, uh, economies are there and the policy is designed in such a way that the monetary policy and the interest rate management is the own and only tool to handle interest, uh, inflation through the inter in interest rate management. But no, I would say India's inflation management, the word taming inflation, or the word keeping it within the tolerance limit, is an exercise of so many different activities, majority of which is outside of the monetary policy, given in today's circumstances. There could have been a time when people would have thought this is sacrilegious for the finance minister of a country to say that. But my experience says, if you're able to equally attend to so many other factors, 
in which I give credit to all governments earlier because they also kept evolving the way in which the supply side can be managed, being very sure of how uh, you know the bulk of our population get all the necessary goods at an affordable price. Trade policy, of course, you refer to it, uh, Professor Bulati, plays a very important role. But even there, it can only go that far and not beyond. Because a consistent performance in exports is what gets you revenue. We saw very enthusiastic and energe energetic revival of our exports. It'll be, the, it'll be the concern and the duty of the government to make sure that energy energetic, that robust performance of export sector are kept alive. Export spanning over several sectors is kept alive. But I think India would definitely do well for itself if its agriculture is very well managed. Even today, in spite of all the various reports that I find, India stopped its export of wheat, which it's opened generously. No, we still are exporting wheat through the World Food Program, which is a structured way of sending, and not probably sending it to countries which are re-exporting from wherever they are doing. So the export continue, which means there is potential for Indian agriculture to feed our own people and also feed the world, if only we manage it very well. And there, again, the balance is you want the maximum potential of agriculture, at the same time, maximum reward for that farmer who faces the situation. So I would say a good management of the economy, ensuring the supply side uh, constraints don't burden the economy, but yet do not too much regulate it. Timely and periodic response to the developments in the ground, making sure the raw materials our obsession sometimes, and right obsession, I'm not faulting there, obsession sometimes is to focus only on the perishable goods, but the focus will also have to be to support in terms of the input prices for small and medium industries, input price, input costs for the agriculture, all of which also add to the burden of inflation. But even more, India's logistics has got to be fixed. More efficient production also becomes for the end consumer a costly item to be purchased purely because you're spending too much time on the road or on the ship or on the train and also spending too much for it. We need to have a comprehensive solution for the logistics addition to the cost of either agriculture or other products. And that is where I think the Gati Shakti, if implemented from now in a far more comprehensive way and taking it down to the granular level would give us some kind of a relief. Make logistics not a menace that it is today. So with all this, I would think India's experience in handling inflation depends so much on so many different factors the central bank, its instruments, its uh, interest rate management form, form a very critical part of it, but it cannot be the one and only one. And in the recent couple of years, the way in which government has managed it uh, answers the question which was raised by um, Deepak Sharma. Manisha, sorry. Sorry, Mishra, Deepak Mishra. And uh, it is that which therefore stands before us as a case to study, case to introspect on, and also case for probably many emerging markets, which are also trying very many such things. Solution to handling inflation should be country specific. Although the problems which add to the problem of inflation are not country specific. It comes across from various different uh, parts of the globe, commodities. It can be because of so many different factors, but the solution has to be unique to each country. And I think India's experience in the last decade or two 
But more specifically in the last few years, it's a case for each one of you to study and give us more input so that the policymakers can be comfortably doing the right things at the right time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am, for enlightening us with deep learning and valuable knowledge. May I now request Professor Gulati to share his thoughts and give vote of thanks to the ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am, for pointing out the importance of synchronization, monetary policy, fiscal policy, trade policy, agriculture, and we never thought of infrastructure that you brought on the table with a multiplier of 2.45. This is remarkable because that's what creates jobs and growth. And uh, we took the full advantage of energy, low prices, diverting that to infrastructure development. Uh, that's a commendable thing. I think it is a package. While the onslaught may be coming from global factors, each country and India are walking a very tight rope uh, balancing the interests of the consumers and the producers, the political economy of typical agriculture pricing. Uh, that's at the heart of the thing. Wish you all the best. I'm sure we will be able to manage it well. The best scenario would be if we have the inflation below 4% and still have growth rates of 7 plus percent. That would be the most ideal situation and all the best wishes to you and we look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I would request everyone to please take seats. We now move to our first session on Global Inflation Scenario, Lessons for India. We'll take a moment here to invite the panelists on dais. I request the audience to be seated. Please welcome our distinguished panelists whose brief profiles are given in the folder with you. Dr. Shankar Acharya is Honorary Professor at ICRIA. Dr. Rakesh Mohan, he is President and Distinguished Fellow at Center for Social and Economic Progress. Dr. Pami Dua, she is Director and Senior Professor at Delhi School of Economics. And Dr. Krishnamurti Subramanian, he is Professor at India School of Business. Dr. Subramanian is present with us online. Welcome to you, sir. May I now request Dr. Ranjana Roy, fellow at ICRIAR, to give the presentation and set the context, and Mr. Deepak Mishra to moderate the discussion. Good morning, everyone. Before we start our panel discussion, I'll be setting the context for the session with a brief overview of global inflation scenario. The worldwide economic slowdown and increasing inflationary pressure are worsening global economic prospects. It has started spiraling since pandemic 
and it got aggravated during the Russia-Ukraine war. Food and fuel prices have surged globally, affecting the vulnerable section of the population, especially in low and middle income countries. Up, we can see here that before, between January and June 2022, around 90% of the emerging economies went through more than 5% level of food price inflation. Some of them even registered double digit inflation. It has serious implication for the emerging economies as food constitute a large share in their consumption basket. For, ex for instance, in India, food constitutes 45% of total consumer expenditure as per NSS's consumer expenditure survey. After a prolonged period, period of low prices, inflation has escalated across economies. In 2021, inflation, global inflation was 4.7% which saw a sharp increase to 8.2% in 2022. And the trend is similar for advanced and as well as emerging economies. The global growth level also downgraded by international organizations for all the economies, both advanced as well as uh, emerging. Now, if we decode uh, inflation vis-a-vis -vis growth at the country level, the picture becomes more interesting. See the experience of advanced economies. USA, UK, Euro, Spain, etc. registered an inflation level at between 8 to 12 percent. For countries like Turkey, Ethiopia, Sri Lanka, it's out of control. Turkey experiencing 80 percent level of inflation, followed by Sri Lanka at 64 percent. Whereas East Asian countries like Japan, China, Vietnam registered inflation rate lower than 4 percent. Japan at its 2.6% level of inflation is at its highest since October 2014. The optimum position of more than 4% growth rate and less than 4% level of inflation, which is shown in the blue shaded area in the graph, is achieved only by Vietnam and Saudi Arabia. For India, comparatively, inflation is projected to be 6.7% by RBI, which is not dramatically different from its historic average of 6.4% between 2000 and 2019. However, it has breached RBI's 6% level of inflation, hence it's making policymakers jittery. But India is doing much better than the advanced economies, but the prices are much higher than the East Asian neighboring countries. So what were the drivers of global inflation? COVID-19 pandemic impacted the economies initially through supply-side bottleneck. Laborers in the non-essential industries could not work due to lockdown and travel-related restrictions. Those measures were necessary during that time, but it had de detrimental effect on the economies. There was decline in wages and income, which in turn led to a decline in aggregate demand. Government across countries had to come up with fiscal stimulus and lose monetary policy. But it led to excess liquidity in the system where too much money was chasing too little commodities, leading to surge in prices. Moreover, negative spillover effect from Russia-Ukraine war also aggravated prices of many commodities. Other than that, structural factors like economic sanctions, decarbonization, etc. also added to price rise. Now, how international prices of food items are behaving? Russia and Ukraine together constitute a major share in the world production and export of commodities like wheat, barley, corn, sunflower seeds, sunflower oil, etc. Supply disruptions due to geopolitical tension and sanctions imposed on Russia resulted in hike in these commodity prices. Moreover, introduction of high biofuel mandates for fuel increased domestic consumption in Indonesia and reduced export. And sudden export ban on crude palm oil by Indonesia also contributed to price rise. Non-food essentials are also no exception. Russia alone uh, is a primary exporter of energy to Europe and China that resulted in high inflation in crude oil and natural gas. Any hike in natural gas prices results in increase in fertilizer prices, which can be seen from the graph below. And as a result, there has been, um, it's, it puts a lot of pressure on countries like India who provides input subsidies like fertilizer. It pu uh, puts a lot of pressure on uh, their subsidy burden and hence um, increases fiscal deficit. Now, how countries are dealing with this? 
an aggregate of 16.9 trillion dollar globally was undertaken to revive the economies from losses incurred during the pandemic figures show that more advanced economies has offered larger amount of fiscal support these keynesian measures were successful in lifting the economies worldwide even central banks in many advanced economies slashed their policy rates to almost zero but these countries are now uh, experiencing high debt burden and also inflationary pressure and these countries are now completely concentrating on containing in inflation through tight monetary policies in order to absorb liquidity from the system like us fed had, has increased its policy rates by 200 basis points between april and august ecb also increased its policy rate by 50 basis points and they have hinted about more increase in the coming future india also increased its repo rate by 140 basis points between may and august now the question arises is whether indian economy is more resilient than the rest of the world we can see from this graph that Indian rupee depreciated by 6% vis-a-vis -vis dollar in the period of April 20 to July 22, which is pretty low compared to countries like Turkey, Argentina, Pakistan, Ukraine, Japan, where depreciation is more than 25%, which indicates that India is in a comfortable position compared to a lot of other countries. However, due to sharp increase in global crude oil prices, rupee has slashed almost breaching 80 mark to us dollar it's inflating the import bill and widening current account deficit but rbi has been closely and continuously monitoring the liquidity condition in the forex market and has stepped in to control the slide with the objective of ensuring orderly market functioning but the question still remains is what is the optimum combination of foreign exchange reserve exchange rate and current account deficit Against this backdrop, the panel may identify policy actions to tame inflation. The pertinent issues that would be discussed are what lessons India can learn from global experience and whether monetary policy alone can contain inflation. With this, I end my presentation. I invite Dr. Mishra to take the discussion forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Randina. Uh, we had assigned about an hour, and I think we've lost a lot of time, so we'll be very quick. I think that was a very helpful presentation to set the context of the session. Uh, we have a wonderful set of panelists. The fact that they, uh, the finance minister felt uh, humble by this set of panelists think of my situation here, um, and they need really no introduction. We have in the, pa uh, the packet that you received includes a detailed profile of our speakers, but to save time and to have maximum time for discussion. I'll just give a one-line introduction for each of them. Uh, to my right is Dr. Shankaracharya, who, as you heard, is the, has been the longest serving chief economic advisor to the government of India. He is also the honorary professor at the career. Uh, to my uh, immediate left is Dr. Rakesh Mohan, who is the president and distinguished fellow at the Center for S Social and Economic Progress, and has held various positions, including the deputy governor of RBI, and India's executive director, Diane Mann. Director of ICRIA, <laughs> Director General of NCAR. There's a lot, and you should see them. Okay. So is actually uh, Dr. Uh, Acharya. Um, and to my extreme left is Dr. Pami Dua, who is the director and a senior professor of Delhi School of Economics. Uh, she has been a member of RBI Monetary Policy Committee and is associated with IZIDR and capital in various capacities. Finally, we have Dr. Krishnamurti Subramaniam, who is joining online from London. Uh, he's a professor at the ISP, Indian School of Business in Hyderabad, and prior to which he was the chief economic advisor to the government of India. I don't think we could have found a better uh, set of panelists to discuss the theme of the session, namely global inflation scenario lessons uh, for India. I think after the discussion we have, I'll add that lesson for India and from India. Uh, I think there's a feeling that there's a lot that the India has done right, which perhaps could also be a blueprint for other countries. So I'll not take any time. I'll just request the panelists that I'd already discussed, uh, you know, suggested few ideas uh, that we could discuss, uh, structure this theme around. Uh, so each of them will take about five to seven minutes to provide their uh, remarks, and then we'll throw open uh, the session for Q&A. And if there are not many questions, then I have some questions to ask. But let's get started. I think we'll go in the same order. It's in the agenda. 
and start with Dr. Chen. It's your turn. Am I audible? Well, uh, well I mean, good morning, friends. I think we are still in the morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to um, thank uh, Dr. Mishra and Dr. Gulati for inviting me to this uh, seminar. Um, uh, I'm really actually here not to impart wisdom, but to learn from all my colleagues on the panel who the kind of noticeable fact is that they're all younger than me. And therefore, by now, they have much more modern human capital than I embody. So my and mine is depreciated a lot more as well. So, um, you know, I'm, if, if some of my views seem old fashioned, well, yes, they are, I guess, are old fashioned. And I can't do much about them. Let me uh, also uh, mention right at the outset that I was uh, uh, extremely impressed by the finance minister's uh, um, uh, sort of detailed grasp of many of the complexities of managing important dimensions of macro policy, in particular inflation here today. And uh, I think it uh, drives home the both the interconnectedness of policymaking as well as its intricacies. And so sometimes what we discuss in groups like this, uh, we do need to bear in mind that when you are in a the hot seat of a of, a, of the finance minister or any minister who's respond, responsible to uh, government and people of India, things are not very easy to uh, make a decision on. Now, I just want to make a few points in a few minutes. And please, uh, Deepak, if I may request, uh, give me a two-minute warning when you're going to shut me up, okay? Because uh, I, I don't want to. Last thing I want to do is overstay. First, you know, I think uh, just to remind everybody, which has already been well known and have been reminded, you know, I think the current inflationary surge in the world, as I understand it, uh, sort of started at the beginning of this calendar year before the Ukraine war. Uh, and that's, I think, important to remember. And I'll come back to that. And the, the war obviously uh, made things much worse. Uh, through supply uh, disruptions, uh, especially in the food and, um, and and fuel, but in other areas as well. And after that, or along with that, we've had, as we all know, uh, the surge in uh, the Chinese China lockdowns, which, given the scale of the China economy in the world, uh, has also led to supply disruptions all across. So I think, however, I think it's important to, be, uh, I, I, at least I'm going to give possibly an iconoclastic and perhaps ill-educated view that the surge in uh, global inflation that we've seen does have a history. And uh, that history is not just a year or two back. I think, frankly, it goes back longer than that to possibly even the global financial crisis, which was one of the most recent major shocks that the world economy as a whole, or almost as a whole, um, Dr. Mohan always calls it the North American crisis, so I have to be careful here. But uh, uh, I, I, let's call it, a, just for the sake of it, everybody else does, a global crisis. And then secondly, of course, since then, we've had the COVID pandemic, which was again a global crisis. Uh, and what I draw as a sort of, not a lesson, but an observation, is that both those crises at their depth did require opening the spigots of both fiscal and monetary policy to counter what might have been otherwise larger declines in real output in large chunks of the world. So that part was right. But on the whole, I think many countries, including some of the leading countries in the world, perhaps including us, that's arguable, I think we were slow to withdraw those stimuli whether they were uh, quantitative easing in monetary, uh, sharp reductions in policy interest rates, or large uh, increases in fiscal deficits, either to stimulate or to live with the situation as it was. So I just want to, I just want to flag that, that this is not just a one-year phenomenon that we're talking about. I think it goes back. And indeed, I believe there's a new theory of money that had come up in the meantime, which kind of said, it's all fine to expand monetary supply. I'm not 
up to date. I'm very lazy nowadays and old, but I'm told that this exists. And um, uh, now, of course, it's probably looking a little uh, woe be gone. Now, the other, another point I'd like to make is that uh, I totally agree with what the finance minister said, that we have to uh, remember, uh, sorry, let me skip that. I'll come to that. Uh, I, I, I'm missing a point. I think we had to learn that the prolonged loose monetary and fiscal policies and the sub combined with the supply shock that we have seen uh, really what turn turned out to be a very potent proof. So the counterfactual is if policies had been tightened gradually a little earlier, we may not have had quite that bad a situation. Can't prove, can't prove that, just a thought. Two minutes, okay, I better rush. Um, now, in terms of management of the uh, inflation, particularly with particular focus on India, uh, clearly uh, we have to have uh, tightening of uh, monetary policy. Uh, and that's not just about the policy rate, it's also about uh, quantitative easing, though we don't call it that. Basically, the monetary aggregates as a whole, liquidity, if you like. We also need, as FM very strongly emphasized, wherever we have that capacity, better and more effective supply management, not just in wheat and rice, uh, possibly certain other products. But we have to, I, I think, and here I may be saying something which uh, is a bit different from the finance minister, is I do believe that that kind of supply management, while very important, has its limitations. Uh, but that's a long story and I don't want to get into that. Now, the particular problem that I want to, as a last thought, uh, if you'll give me the minute, uh, that I want to leave uh, with all of you, is that I think in management of inflation, we have a particular special problem in India which is not that common across all other larger economies. In fact, we may be almost unique. And that is, we have an unusual history of running large general government deficits, what's sometimes called the problem of fiscal dominance. And I think we do have it. I think we do suffer from it. And it constrains in an important way the, the effectiveness and content of monetary policy, whether expansionary or contractionary. Uh, essentially because what is a fiscal deficit? It's the borrowing requirement of government. And if the central bank, the RBI, has essentially to manage and implement large scale borrowing on behalf of the government, not for itself, but on government account, it is kind of predisposed, if you like, to keep monetary policy loose, because otherwise interest rates would go through the roof if it didn't. And I think that's, that's, that's a serious problem. And the lesson I draw from that is inflation management in our system should involve not even at the micro level and leaving aside the supply management, which is necessary also, should involve fiscal consolidation, especially when, as you know, in the last, for the, probably the, for the first time in our history, this will be the first time that we'll have three years in succession of the general government deficit or the combined center states deficit of above 10% of GDP. If you recall, it was 14% in the first COVID year. Last year was 11%, and this year it's likely to be between 10 and 11%. And associated high uh, uh, public debt of nearly 90%. So against that background, I think that uh, for us to deploy the standard macro tool of monetary policy is just not enough. We also have to have fiscal consolidation going along, and that's going to be a real challenge. Finally, the last thought, just want to say that uh, we also need to remember that uh, inflation is something that we have to worry about because it hurts the poorest segments of our society most. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Acharya. I think in your soft and subtle way, you did uh, say that you know, the old economics is good enough to explain the new economy or the new inflation regime. Uh, uh, I think we'll have a good, interesting discussion forward. But we look forward to hearing from Dr. Mohan. I'll flag you.
Uh, I, I, may, I may not heed you. That's a different issue. <laughs> That's the case. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Deepak, uh, Shok, uh, old uh, co-conspirators for a long time. But uh, he usually, whenever uh, he works with me, then he'll, he usually runs away. So, uh, um, but thank you very much for inviting me. And I must uh, congratulate Ranjana, where are you? Um, for an excellent uh, presentation, an excellent compilation of uh, information. Very, very useful, I think, to prepare for this, uh, for, for this session. Um, you know, I succeeded Shankar uh, as Chief Economic Advisor. But the difference is that time he was there for what, seven years or eight years or 10 years or what is it? Nine years? And I was there for only a year and a half. Eight years. I was there for only a year, year and a half. Today I have equal time. So uh, much easier to succeed him uh, today. Um, again, beginning on a lighter note, if you observe this uh, graph here, no, if you look at this graph here, Note when I left the Reserve Bank of India, <laughs> you will find the key variable when inflation goes up uh, and before when it's controlled without inflation targeting. Um, so uh, I uh, echo very much what uh, Shankar said. I think the most important thing, and I'll go into that a little more, that I, uh, Shankar also said that to a certain extent, uh, the finance minister's observation that inflation management is much more complicated than inflation targeting. Um, I have always maintained that. That is why as long as at least I was there, we resisted inflation targeting. I always think of inflation targeting monetary policy as stupid economics, thinking of the, of, of the macroeconomy as a hydraulic system where you raise interest rate, inflation goes down, you raise in, inflation goes up, uh, sorry, in, um, inflation goes up, and therefore is you raise this or inflation goes down, you, you reduce it. Uh, I mean, just standard thinking of any macro system, it can't be that inflation is one variable explanation. I've always been puzzled why all the macro gurus in the world, the monetary gurus in the world, um, believe in this. I just don't understand. I said this, I've said this everywhere, uh, right from the time that I joined the Reserve Bank. Maybe the difference is that I was never trained in monetary economics. So I wasn't contaminated uh, by standard thinking. Uh, but this is very important. I'm not saying it uh, lightly, actually, because I've written about it. I've talked about it all the time. Um, and yes, as uh, in the current situation, yes, as uh, Shankar said, well, everyone, of course, agrees on this, that it is the combined impact of fiscal stimulus and monetary policy. And again, as Shankar said, not just recently, pre-COVID, and also ever since the North Atlantic financial crisis. And uh, one of the uh, important aspects of that um, is um, uh, that after the North Atlantic financial crisis, uh, despite the huge fiscal and monetary stimulus, there was no inflation. In fact, inflation targeting didn't work at the other side equally. That is to say that inflation was lower than 2%, almost all through till until recently in the developed world. So inflation targeting didn't work on that side either, that even it was low, despite the fact that you had uh, um, uh, negative real interest rates, policy rates, you couldn't bring inflation up. So it, it hasn't worked in either direction, unless you do very, very high inflation, unless you do a real sledgehammer, which of course does work. Uh, there's no question about that. That's what Paul Volcker did. Uh, uh, in, uh, in 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 the early uh, early late seventies uh, early eighties, so you know I think that this is something to be learned here. The second impact of that belief system, or I should often call religious faith, inflation targeting, was that um, when the inflation did start rising, and it was much before Ukraine. Again, as Shankar pointed out, that's the problem. That you know, when he speaks before me, I you know I have a difficulty that I can't find things to dis disagree with him. Um, that uh, even before Ukraine, as you pointed out, inflation has started going up, and also after Ukraine, the belief was that this is transitory. Why was that belief is transitory? Because of the belief that inflation targeting had anchored people's inflation expectations. Now, there is some truth to that also, by the way, that today, for example, in the United States, inflation expectations, I think, is 
two years or Deepika, two is or three years hence, right? It's still 2.5, if I remember correctly. So there is some truth to that in terms of inflation uh, anchoring, but nonetheless, it's because of that excessive fear that because of the supply chain uh, disruptions, et cetera, the belief was that this is transitory and therefore that restrained central banks from acting as quickly uh, as, as, as they should have. Um, the, and that it would reverse pretty quickly, again, because of this belief. And clearly it's become uh, obvious that it's not transitory. It is generalized. It's not just because of uh, supply chain uh, disruptions. That of course is an important element. There's no question about that. But the, the, uh, the understanding that it was transitory is wrong and has become generalized. As you can see in the various charts that have been done, in terms of core inflation uh, being high as well. And this is where, of course, what the financial minister said, uh, emphasized a number of times, and again, Shankar mentioned it, that if you have uh, the CPI weight of not just food or shock, but energy as higher than 50%, then I don't understand which theory says that you do inflation targeting, which unfortunately we, 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 we went to after this. This, this period. So in some sense, it was not surprising to, to a certain extent. There's no good, very good efficient targeting. The damn thing has gone up, gone up too much. And remember, this also went up because of excessive fiscal and monetary uh, stimulus uh, after the NFC. Um, so um, what are the lessons? Um, inflation, we have to be, as economists, I believe, particularly as macro monetary economists, we need to have much more humility in admitting that we don't have adequate understanding of inflation dynamics. We just don't, and I certainly don't. Um, second, I think we have learned from our own experience after North Atlantic financial crisis, and the in some of the Western countries experience now, that uh, when you do a monetary or fiscal stimulus, you've got to be careful. There's no question, again, in my mind, that after COVID, that with COVID, lockdowns, et cetera, fiscal stimulus was absolutely necessary everywhere in the world. You can argue what the magnitudes. We can now say, post facto, that we were smarter. And I have to admit that when we were being smart or not doing as much of fiscal stimulus, I was critical of it. But now I admit I was wrong, and I think we were right, that we didn't do as much of fiscal stimulus as many other developed countries, but I, was, I used to say that to that point. So I think that's a lesson that, yes, you have to do what you have to do to preserve welfare, people's uh, consumption, et cetera, but be careful, even more so in monetary stimulus, that yes, again, you have to do it at that time to keep the financial markets in operation. But again, I think we've learned here what happens. If you don't withdraw it fast enough, you have inflation that is not transitory. Because remember, apart from relative prices, that may be food prices or uh, energy prices going up, uh, as macro economists, as monetary economists, you always look at generalized inflation. And whereas you can do supply management, etc., to have some uh, control of sectoral prices or relative prices, it has to be macro measures to manage generalized inflation, both fiscal and monetary. Third, um, the uh, sorry, fourth, um, as I've already said, inflation dynamics not well understood, and too much faith in information, uh, sorry, in, in inflation targeting uh, sort of economic hydraulics, uh, and of course, what I mentioned about the CPI. Um, the uh, now going a little forward, um, there is, as Deepak said right in the beginning, there is a bit of a puzzle. Uh, how come? You know, a good part of the developed world with uh, what's is it what, 60 percent now? U.S. and Europe with about 60 percent of the global economy, something of that order. Something of that order. More like more like 40. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that how come they have such high inflation and we don't? I think part of the explanation is again, and it was in the charts somewhere that almost all Asian countries are slow except of course for Pakistan and Sri Lanka, given the current crisis they're experiencing. So in some sense, there needs to be better understanding 
that we are more connected to Asia. We are not Europeans, for God's sake. Yet we withdraw from our step, but we go off to Europe and the F and the US to do FTAs. I'm glad the finance minister is not here right now. Um, but more seriously, I think that we need to, in, in thinking about our global connections, we need to do more research on this to understand, also from the inflation side, the interconnectivity, how much we are connected to there, how much we're connected to here. Um, most of my mind, uh, I'll just list these. I have about a minute or okay, then I'll take a minute more. Um, <laughs> the, that you really have to use all tools. Okay, this, this is just expanding on this theme of this one instrument, one target is just plain wrong. Uh, we need to use multiple instruments. It is Dr. Jalan going against the then thinking, was it called 1998? I think he expressed it multiple instruments which I think is what we should follow, effectively what we've been doing, which is use all tools. Um, you, I have an article which I wrote called Managing the Impossible Trinity. Of course, that's internal contradiction there. But you have to manage the impossible trinity. Uh, you have to use all tools, uh, forex uh, intervention, exchange rate management, um, the uh, active liquidity management, which, which RBI does all the time. Um, financial regulation uh, of uh, the financial system for financial stability. Also, given the fiscal dominance that Shankar talked about, where SLR is uh, the instrument to some extent that we have used uh, so that you know the kind of uh, fiscal deficits that we have do overall general government doesn't, are not very different from Argentina and so on. But we've never had that problem because we don't have a, uh, that kind of external uh, debt and ex ex external exposure. And we've been doing all this domestically. We've been able to do it because we've been fixing it through SLR, et cetera. And you have to keep doing that, quite frankly, as long as you have this kind of fiscal dominance. So CRR, SLR, use all those tools. Um, and final point, uh, Deepak, you're getting very nervous. Final point, uh, look at the rest of the world. Keep looking at the rest of the world. Not that you copy them, never. I think that what the Reserve Bank has shown, what Indian macro management has shown is that we most of the time we've had a different view. Uh, and what we have managed to some extent better, of course, now and then we fail. Uh, so, and don't underestimate global spillovers. And that's my last point, which is that given what's happening in inflation in the US, Europe, UK, I mean, Germany, Germany, for God's sake, right? Germany, 9% inflation. And in that context, in terms of the future, given that inflation is in this region of 8, 9, 7, 8, 9, 10 percent in the Western world, you will see unions rising up. You will see far more wage pressures. And so it's not going to go away in a hurry. Just watch out. Thank you very much. Um, if there's a German in the room, you should feel that's a compliment. How much we regard the German inflation, you know, uh, so so that's a uh, but lots of very nice sound bites and important points. If you know media folks are watching, you know, inflation management is not inflation targeting. More humility in understanding inflation dynamics. Use all tools. Look, but don't copy. Uh, so very interesting presentation, Dr. Moon. Now can I turn to Dr. Pamidua, please? A very good morning to all of you. I am honored to be a part of this panel and I especially thank Dr. Ashok Gulaki and Dr. Deepak Mishra for inviting me here. Of course, I'm speaking after Dr. Shankar Acharya and Dr. Rakesh Mohan. So I'm not sure what value addition I will make, but I will try to say a few things. I will say a little bit about uh, the post-COVID fiscal uh, stimulus, and I will also touch on monetary policy and also specifically try to answer the question, were central bankers late to tighten policies? And what could they have done to be on time? Is there a tool we could have used? And then in this context, I will also look at the contribution 
of inflation targeting regime in India. Now, as we all know, during the pandemic, central banks lowered policy rates and bought bonds to the tune of billions of their currencies. Central bank balance sheets ballooned, markets were flooded with liquidity. But even when inflationary pressures were visible, the rates were not changed and the central banks did not change their strategy. So in that sense, possibly they implicitly contributed to the rise in inflation. Now, the expansionary monetary policy in most of the countries was accompanied by loose fiscal policy in an attempt to revive the global economy, which had contracted even more than the contraction during the global financial crisis. To push back against the COVID recession, most major Western economies injected huge amounts of fiscal stimulus in the form of government support or relief packages. In the US, for example, additional trillions of dollars reached consumers, some of whom had not lost jobs, but were confined to their homes, and therefore spent the flow of cash on goods rather than services that they no longer used during the pandemic. Because the resultant demand for goods far exceeded international manufacturers' capacity to produce and ship them, prices naturally skyrocketed. The problem is that this continued for far too long. Inflation was increasing, but monetary policy rates were still very low, negative in Europe, zero in the US, and the Fed and the ECB continued buying bonds. This meant that inflation was just going higher and higher. Now, central banks around the world are trying to contain inflation by hiking interest rates. So far in 2022, at least 45 countries have raised interest rates. To deal with inflation, for example, the Bank of England already made its sharpest hike in 27 years in early August, when it raised the cost of borrowing by 50 basis points to 1.75%. Central banks of major advanced economies are withdrawing monetary support more aggressively now, thus restricting the flow of money into the system with the aim to bring down inflation. The longer term implications of these increases are also visible with, for instance, the mortgage rates rising and financial conditions becoming tighter. Now, in this context, I would like to say basically two points on the effectiveness of monetary policy. A lot has already been said, but I just want to uh, emphasize that um, first point is that we have to recognize that there are inflation cycles just like there are business cycles. So there is a low point and there is a high point and there is a way to predict the turning points of the inflation cycle. So what we need is a leading indicator of the peaks and troughs of the inflation cycle. And that will give us some idea of what the direction of inflation will be. And this would then allow the central banks to use a preemptive approach rather than a reactive approach. So this tool is very important. And I will say more about this. And the second point about monetary policy is that we have to recognize the importance of establishing credibility of the monetary policy, whether it is in the form of a monetary policy process or whether it is in the form of forward guidance or communications. So first, if I look at the reactive versus preemptive approach of central banks, so what was the problem? The problem was that major Western central banks led by the Fed 
provided massive amounts of monetary stimulus in an effort to get the economy back to its pre-COVID state at the very earliest. Secure in the delusion that the surge in inflation was merely transitory and would die down, the Fed kept rates at the zero lower bound and continued to engage in unprecedented quantitative easing for too long, turbocharging the inflation cycle upswing. The problem was that in so doing, the Fed was adhering to a reactive rather than a preemptive approach. If instead the Fed had utilized a leading indicator or a predictor of the direction of change of inflation rates, it would have preemptively changed interest rates. In this case, hiked them sooner. A comprehensive indicator or harbinger for inflation has already been constructed for many years now. It has been available to the US and this was constructed by the Economic Cycle Research Institute in New York and was actually closely tracked and used by Alan Greenspan, if you look at his statements. This is called the future inflation gauge, which helped the Fed under Greenspan to preemptively hike rates and then preemptively cut rates in the period 1994 to 96. Now, if we base our analysis on this future inflation gauge, then the Economic Cycle Research Institute had formally warned of a US inflation cycle upturn in September 2020. But it took another year and a half, far too long, for the Fed to begin tightening monetary policy. Then, in an exercise of international groupthink, many other central banks, such as the Bank of England and the European Central Bank, followed the Fed's intellectual and methodological lead. Therefore, all the central banks were late in raising interest rates. Now, um, the second point I want to say is about credibility of monetary policy, very important. And in this context, I want to focus on the flexible inflation targeting approach in India, how that has helped to establish a credible monetary policy in India. Now, uh, with the signing of the Monetary Policy Framework Agreement between the Government of India and the RBI in 2015, flexible inflation targeting was formally adopted in India. And in May 2016, the Reserve Bank of India Act 1934 was amended to provide a statutory basis for the implementation of the Flexible Inflation Targeting Framework. And then the central government specified the 4 plus minus 2% band for the headline inflation, the consumer price index. Now, so there was an amendment in the act. So this is not a trivial matter. And then this band was specified. But more than that, there was also this condition that if RBI fails to meet this target uh, for three successive quarters, then it has to give an explanation. So there is discipline in the process. There is accountability in the process. And then to top it all, which does not exist in other countries, other developed countries also, the uh, members of the Monetary Policy Committee responsible for handling the setting of interest rates are required to give their own statement, which is made public 14 days after the meeting. And therefore, each member is accountable. The system has to be transparent. And therefore, there is credibility in this process. And um, so I think in some sense, we have at least some of the factors in place in monetary policy. I am not saying that monetary policy is the answer for controlling inflation. And we have heard a lot about that already. We have fiscal policy, we have external policy, then 
it's not just interest rates. There are macro prudential policies that uh, are also used. And we have a wide range of policies. But what I wanted to say, two points about the monetary policy, which is that we have to be preemptive and we have to ensure credibility if we want to control the inflation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pamidua. And my apology for rushing all of the speakers in because we actually don't have enough time. We are almost uh, done with the session um, timing as far as the thing. But uh, thank you very much for a very interesting and in some sense, you provided a bit of a more defense on the inflation targeting and had you got more time, we could have had the debate between you and Dr. Mohan. But um, uh, not least, uh, uh, last but not the least, and very patiently waiting, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Subramaniam, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Krishnamurti Subramaniam uh, from London. And I'm uh, thankful to you for staying uh, for this whole session and listening to all the presentation. Uh, so, uh, session, and a mic is to you now. You Thank you very this? much, Deepak. Um, and let me start by thanking the conference organizers, especially Dr. Gulati, for inviting me to share my thoughts. Um, having uh, been at the helm of affairs in, you know, um, designing the policy um, that uh, has led to the outcomes that we're debating about uh, today. I'll share my perspective on, uh, you know, how we went about thinking about, um, you know, the policy. The Honorable F Finance Minister did talk about uh, some of those aspects. Um, let me start by first uh, agreeing with uh, both Dr. Shankaracharya and, uh, and Dr. Rakesh Mohan about the fact that uh, this inflation phenomenon that we are seeing, especially in the rest of the world, is not just due to the Ukraine war. It predates it uh, for sure. Um, and it has its uh, antecedents in the, um, you know, in, in uh, the uh, very, very loose fiscal and monetary policy uh, that was indulged in, uh, especially during COVID. <clears throat> So uh, let me share with you my perspective about how we went about thinking, you know, when, when COVID struck. Um, uh, I, I, Dr. Shankaracharya will remember a session that uh, was held um, when the, you know, the, the, the PMO had invited him and other uh, scholars to uh, think about the <clears throat> uh, COVID policy response. And he would remember... Uh, I, I distinctly remember him mentioning or not agreeing with the supply side measures that we were actually uh, focusing on at that time. And, uh, you know, uh, I was happy to be in the minority of one pushing for the supply side response. Um, and uh, the rationale for that um, is something that I would like to explain. Uh, Firstly, uh, I, and, and here I think in some in in, in spirit I would uh, agree with uh, Dr. Rakesh Mohan, uh, having not learned or not having done directly research in macroeconomics, but come coming from the financial economic side, I think it helped to be uh, not sort of um, having those blinkers that oftentimes just reading the literature has uh, and you know being open minded. So some of the key considerations that uh, went into India's uh, policy uh, design was, first thing that we did was we uh, analyzed the uh, response that India had in the previous crisis, um, especially the Asian financial crisis and the global financial crisis. Um, and what stood out for me, especially uh, in the response to the uh, global financial crisis was that uh, it was just uh, clear, just you know, implementation of the Keynesian uh, you know, prescription of, of uh, 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 you know, a, a demand side stimulus. Um, what we did recognize though, and I think this, this was very crucial, was that COVID will certainly lead to uh, supply side disruptions, huge supply side disruptions, because um, unlike, uh, you know, turning on and off a switch, you know, to put on lights, when, e when the economic engine is, uh, you know, is halted, due to lockdowns, uh, the economic you know, engine does not rev back to capacity immediately. And I think therefore supply side dis disruptions were inevitable. Um, I, I do remember sort of um, you know, mentioning to my teammates and also to um, you know, the 
uh, Honorable Finance Minister and um, other secretaries that um, if, if we basically take the, uh, you know, what happened in the global financial crisis, double digit inflation for uh, more than, you know, for, for, for almost 18 months in the, in the global financial crisis, when supply side disruptions were not large, add to that the enormous supply side disruptions that COVID brings, you know, if we replicate the policy that happened during global financial crisis, we may be looking at 20% plus inflation, you know, uh, for, for a very, very la long period. Uh, the, this is important, you know, and this is where India differs from the rest of the economy. And here's maybe because of my uh, sort of, uh, 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 you know, uh, hat as a business school professor, I've always believed that compared to advanced economies, you know, um, in, in India, actually, whether it's the uh, on the output side or on the inflation side, supply side frictions, you know, bite far, far more um, in India than than in the, um, you know, in the advanced economies. And I think partly it's also because of our socialist history, where we've always sort of treated the production side with a lot of um, suspicion um, and have definitely not worked enough on enabling enabling the supply side so so uh, i think the the fact that in an emerging economy like india especially with its history of um, sort of socialist uh, uh, um, you know era policies i think supply side frictions were very important so if we basically had gone about imitating what the you know what the west was doing or imitating what you know was done in the in the in the global financial crisis and by the way there is actually a very sort of very a common thread that runs, you know, maybe the same kind of thinking, you know, what the West has done, you know, in COVID is very similar to what, you know, was, was what India had done during the global financial crisis, but it's distinctly different from what has been done by India in COVID. Um, the, you know, uh, yesterday uh, th there was a piece that of mine that came in the Times of India, which clearly shows if you, if you plot, you know, the increase in inflation over the last one, one year, with, with, you know, against three-year growth, um, you know, GDP growth, India stands out as the positive outlier with a very tight relationship between, you know, uh, uh, between increase in inflation now and the uh, GDP growth uh, in other countries. And that is because uh, the stimulus that was provided during COVID, of course, you know, um, had a huge role to play in ensuring that the GDP growth was was higher than what it would have otherwise been. But also, that is the the uh, uh, um, you know the main the main uh, sort of uh, factor that is driving inflation today. Um, I have put out uh, you know in on LinkedIn and on my Twitter account um, an article that actually lays out the key principles that um, you know that that drove the Indian uh, you know Indian COVID policy response. I don't have time to go through it in detail, but I'll just enlist the uh, six principles that were uh, that drove our policy response, um, and I'll conclude with you know with with with, with that. Um, so the first principle I think is is very important. I, I I think any economist will recognize is that the impact of macro policy on economic out outcomes is always felt with a lag, and I think that's something uh, you know. Uh, um, so so what we see with uh, inflation you know predating the ukraine war is the lagged effect of the fiscal and uh, monetary looseness in, in in other countries and second and here's where actually now the the principles that drove india's policy response be, and, and it being different from the rest of the uh, countries is the fact that you know a macro policy that only increases demand um, can only deliver a short term growth stimulus um, but will deliver long term high inflation um, and also will prompt monetary policy authorities to actually raise rates. Um, in contrast, macro policy that works on both supply and demand will deliver longer term growth because it will lead to monetary and fiscal policy working you know, in synchronicity um, and in, without, without high inflation. There's, I think, research by other panelists in the, in the I think the next panel, Ashima Goel and others actually, which clearly shows that uh, this, is, this is true. So this was one of the key aspects that drove India's policy response, recognizing that the you know, COVID is going to have huge supply side disruptions. There's going to be a shrink in supply and not working on supply side, therefore will mean that we might actually have been looking at 20% plus inflation. Um, and sec third principle being the revenue expenditure. And, and this is something that the uh, you know, finance minister covered as well, but spoke about. You know, we uh, wrote about this in detail in the, uh, you know, in the economic survey, arguing for countercyclical fiscal policy. The fact that revenue expenditure is myopic because it actually not only does it not um, generate the, 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 the multipliers that are actually above one, 
At the same time, they also it also fuels inflation. Um, you know, but but it oftentimes requires its political will is important to be able to resist the temptation for just doing revenue expenditure and and doing capital expenditure. And this is where I think a lot of credit should go to the political executive. The fourth principle is that capital expenditure increases both demand and supply while revenue expenditure only increases demand. And that is why it fuels inflation. Um, and I think the last couple of principles are extremely important, you know, why uh, the capital expenditure focus happened during COVID, that capital expenditure, by, and especially on, um, you know, infrastructure, et cetera, crowds in private investment, uh, while revenue expenditure crowds out private investment. And finally, in I know at any time of crisis, um, I think it's uh, more than any other component of GDP. It is always investment that uh, you know suffers very badly because of the uncertainty that a crisis creates. Um, and I think uh, it's to sort of uh, ensure that the vacuum that is created in private investment because of this risk aversion, because of the uncertainty, what we economists think about as a second moment impact, you know, I think it is important for government to basically fill that gap in by raising capital expenditure. And this is basically what was, um, you know, what, what, what these were the principles that drove India's, India's response. I'll, I'll, I'll end by making a comment actually by, you know, uh, sort of taking a thread out of um, uh, uh, Dr. Mishra saying that, you know, he's, for the first time he's seeing in his you know, long career where, where, where the economic outcomes and advanced economies are worse than that in, that in India. And then uh, Dr. Rakesh Mohan actually sort of, um, you know, Germany, 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 actually, um, uh, I, I think maybe because I sort of uh, belong to a generation um, that does not believe in giving so much reverence to the advanced economies, um, I, I, I think uh, th that, that's the theme, that's the idea or th thought that I want to leave, um, you know, participant, participants with that I think this, this uh, sort of kind of being enamored with uh, the advanced economy saying they, they know it all about policy, I think is possibly is already changing and I think we've showed it, showed it uh, with the COVID era. And I think going forward, it will certainly be true. And so at least, at least, you know, the generation of uh, uh, economists um, and, and uh, members, you know, uh, maybe in, in our generation should actually have far more self-confidence um, and not necessarily be so enamored by anything that the advanced economies, uh, you know, put out. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop um, and uh, hand it over back to uh, Dr. Mishra. Thank you very much, Dr. Krishnamurti. Yeah. Thanks for making me feel very young. Uh, no, um, but I know that there are two people, I have, we have no time, we have completely run out of time, so we can't have Q&A, but I know two people are uh, you know, invoked, so I just want to give an opportunity if Dr. Uh, Acharya, just a one-line rebuttal, and if Dr. Mohan wants to say anything, but otherwise we'll close it. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mishra. No, this is not a rebuttal, just a thought which I intended to say initially, but I now want to. I forgot, I just want to say it because I think it's important, which is it's not just a matter of coordinating monetary policy and fiscal policy in order to make them both more uh, um, important. But I think in the current situation, fiscal consolidation is also required uh, in order for us to be able to manage our balance of payments. Because as you all know, that the current account deficit on the balance of payments is now for this year projected to be in the order of three and a half to four percent of GDP, which in the usual normal Indian form, format or metric is regarded as dangerously high. And to help manage that, uh, it's not just trade policy, but you need to do uh, the sound macroeconomics. Thank you. Thank you. I think, um, very quickly. Yeah, one just, uh, just one comment. Um, you know, I talked about. Uh, Dr. Bimal Jalan, who is another generation older than I am, um, having started the multiple instrument monetary policy when the developed world uh, was going off for inflation targeting. So I just wanted to remind you of that. Okay. Thank you. I'll yeah. come to you, Subhu, also, since everybody gets a one line. Yeah, so this is a one liner. I want to say that in the Great Recession, uh, India came out unscathed. While well, most of the world went into recession, India and in fact China did not go into a recession. They only had a slowdown. So 
even during that episode, India did better than the rest of the world. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Subhu, anything, any last words? Yeah, I think just one uh, comment in terms of the uh, inflation scenarios that we can expect in India versus the rest of the world. And I think uh, Dr. Rakesh Mohan has touched on this on the inflation expectations. I think inflation expectations will get far, far more uh, strongly anchored in the advanced economies because they have seen, you know, 300, 400 percent higher inflation compared to what has been their average. Um, and in contrast, India, I think, you know, we have been about 6% higher than our historical average. I mean, I say historical from 1960 to 2021. And, you know, the recent research shows that about um, half of inflation comes from inflation expectations. So the slopes for inflation going forward in India, you know, might be more uh, sharply declining than uh, the rest of the rest of the world. Um, I think that's, that's the comment I wanted to make. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think this is a wonderful session. I know there are uh, some question on online, but uh, my real apology, we just don't have time to take on any question. Uh, no, I'm really sorry because we are running into lunch time. So thank you very much. But uh, the panelists are all uh, available to take your question. If you have any biology questions, uh, talk to them during coffee time. But let's put up a, a hand together for a wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was an exemplary discussion and wonderfully moderated by Dr. Mishra. Thank you to our panelists for sharing valuable inputs. We will get these comments together and incorporate them in an ongoing study. May I now request all of you to please join for a short tea break and we will get back here in another 10 minutes by 10.45 or by 12.45 at maximum. Thank you.
Welcome back. I would like to request everyone please, to please take your seats so that we can start with the next session. Sure. After the thought-provoking panel discussion, we'll keep the ball rolling and move to our next session on taming inflation in India. Please welcome our distinguished panelists for this session. Brief profile of them are given in the folder with you. Dr. Sitikanta Patnayak, he's executive director of RBI and looks after economic and policy research. Dr. Dharmkirti Joshi, he's chief economist at Crisin. Dr. Ashok Gulati, Distinguished Professor for Agriculture, ICRIAR. Dr. Ashima Goel, Emeritus Professor, IGIDR. Dr. Goel is present with us online. Welcome to you, ma'am. Also, please welcome Ms. Methli Bhusnurmat, Senior Advisor at NCAER. She will moderate the panel discussion. And Dr. Shaima Jose, Fellow at ICRIAR, will give the background presentation. So uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, I'm be presenting on taming inflation in India. And I'll briefly set the context on the current inflationary situation in India, the reason uh, in, uh, driving inflation and what uh, policies government had taken to tame inflation and what further ought to be done to contain inflation. So uh, as we have seen in the earlier presentation uh, on the global scenario, uh, like the advanced and the emerging economies, India has also been experiencing inflationary pressure since 2021. And if you look at the RBI projections for financial year 23, it is around for inflation is around 6.7% and for growth it's around 7.2% which is much uh, uh, the inflation projections are much above the RBI tolerance level of 6% and this was not the only uh, time period when inflation was high it, inflation has been in double digit uh, almost 10 more than 10% in the earlier years and if you look at the uh, previous decade between 4 5 to 13 14 inflation was around the average inflation for the period was around 7.9% and so was the growth rate it was around 7.7% relatively uh, in the recent decade between 14 15 till uh, till now the average inflation is around 5.1% and so is the growth rate around 5.6% so this uh, the de decade had a lower uh, inflation and lower growth as compared to the other uh, previous decade and so the ideal situation would be higher growth and low inflation but somehow india has not been able to achieve that in the current uh, decade 
and now we'll discuss what is the relationship between retail inflation and wholesale inflation so for july retail inflation was 6.7% although the momentum had declined from june from 7.01% but it has still breached rbi's upper tolerance level for seven consecutive months since january 2021 but please note uh, wpi is almost hovering around uh, uh, 13.93% in july and it's almost double of that of cpi inflation and uh, so the question here is will wpi percolate down to cpi level in the coming months and if it does it's going to be a huge challenge for the policy maker to contain inflation so that brings us to the question of the structure of cpi uh, in india and what role food plays in the cpi structure so if you look at the left hand side pie it basically shows the uh, weightage of different major groups in the cpi weight and if you see the green uh, bar where which shows food and beverages it's almost 45.86% in the total cpi basket which is based on the 2011-12 nss data so india basically has an overwhelming weight of food but look at the other countries the advanced countries which are shown on the right hand side uh, bar graph germany or any other advanced countries have a range of uh, food weight between 8 to 20% whereas india has a weightage of almost 45.9% so india's cpi basket is somewhat unique because of the high weightage of food and uh and because moreover the higher weightage of food makes it cumbersome for the monetary policy to tame inflation and it becomes a difficulty for the policy makers so we have also looked at what is driving cpi inflation across major groups and in july the cpi as i mentioned before july the cpi inflation was around 6.7% and of that 6.7% almost 60% was contributed by food and beverages and fuel and light together food and beverages were accounting for 46.9% of contribution in july but if you look at may and june figure the weightage of uh, the contribution of food uh, and beverages was more than 50% and that makes us question what are the drivers of food inflation in india so to uh, calculate or compute what are the major drivers of uh, food and beverages inflation we have calculated the contribution to food and beverages inflation so in july the food and beverage inflation was around 6.7% and the major driver within food and beverages were vegetables cereal product prepared meal milk product followed by spices and oil and fat and if you look at over temporal trend between january to july and if you look at the brown which shows vegetable the contribution of vegetable to, to cpi inflation has actually doubled from 13% in january to almost 21% in july look at cereals cereals contribution has increased from almost 12% to 19% between the seven uh, months but uh, see oil and fat uh, interestingly the oil, contribution of oil and fat to total cpi inflation uh, to, 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 to uh, total food and beverage inflation has actually halved from january to july it was 25.6% in january it's only 9.5 9.5% and this basically corroborates with the international scenario where the uh, edible oil prices have slashed which is getting reflected and uh, softening the domestic oil and fat inflation as well so now we'll discuss some of the uh, commodities where prices are surging and one is vegetables as we have seen earlier vegetables is the largest contributor to food and beverage inflation and within vegetable tomato inflation in july was almost 44.2% and it was unprecedented in june almost 158% and tomato like other perishables follows a price cobweb phenomenon where a lower realization of prices forces farmer to shift acreage to the other crops thereby increasing prices that what that's what we witnessed this year and uh, for that we have also shown the uh, 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 the graph on the uh, left and right hand side so basically shows onion tomato and potato and how volatile the prices are how volatile the inflation is the second commodity is, is cereal and product and within cereal and product wheat inflation was almost 12% in july and the high inflationary pressure in wheat was because of the significant fall in procurement this year it's almost 50% fall also a marginal drop in the production moreover the export led demand had increased the prices more than the minimum support price because of which uh, and citing uh, food security reasons government had banned wheat export on may 13 and wheat flour export on may uh, august uh, 25th 
moreover rice is also uptaking in the recent month and this is mostly export led and uh, the recent reports of uh, lower sowing of rice is going to not, not to augur well for the cereal price outlook in the coming months the other commodity uh, that we'll be discussing is edible oil and unlike vegetable and cereals where inflationary pressure was due to uh, supply side and export led uh, edible oil is mostly imported inflation and with the russia ukraine war and even the resultant supply side disruption and impulsive export ban by indonesia which though was lifted later on had increased the international edible oil prices which got transmitted to even domestic prices although now the domestic prices in edible oil have slashed Uh, the other non food commodity that we'll be discussing is fuel and light and within fuel and light kerosene pds uh, is uh, the inflation in kerosene pds was almost 108% in july and this was the largest contributor to cpi inflation in july and the reason has been the policy correction because the subsidy on kerosenes have been removed and now they are selling at the market price although the deal india uh, has with russia to get almost 30% discount rate is going to soften uh, the inflation in fuel and light so what are the other downside risks that may impact inflation and as a uh, uh, finance minister had spoken monsoon plays a significant part so uh, we know that there has been an uneven uh, uneven distribution of rainfall across states especially in northeastern and eastern states look at uttar pradesh bihar uh, jharkhand manipur and tripura the deficient rainfall is more than 40% especially in uttar pradesh bihar and manipur so this is may impact the curry production and may not augur well for the price outlook in the coming months so now we'll be discussing what are the policies taken by the government to contain inflation the first one is monetary policy and uh, lord have it said in the earlier presentation as well so the major central banks of uh, different countries have been hiking the key policy rate and so has the rbi it has increased uh, the key po policy rate especially repo rate by 140 basis point between may and august and now the repo rate is around 5.4% and the question here is will monetary policy will be alone uh, alone will be enough to contain food inflation given the fact that food inflation in india is caused not due to excessive demand but due to global inflationary pressure and supply side bottleneck so second policy option is as discussed by dr acharya also a prudent fiscal tightening and we know during the pandemic government had infused a large uh, fiscal uh, stimulus into the economy to revive the economy and it had increased the fiscal deficit to uh, almost 9 to 9.2% in at central level and 4.7% at the state level although this year the government uh, is uh, predicts or expects the uh, fiscal deficit to be around 6.4% in financial year 2023 but given the uh, russia ukraine war the uh, supply side bottleneck the costlier ex exports weakened rupee will it contain in 6.4% that is an important question because even only uh, uh, food and fertilizer subsidy alone going to cost more than 5 trillion which is going to put pressure on the fisc so what policy action can be taken on the trade fund and uh, we know that government had banned wheat flour export and uh, wheat export and also restricted sugar exports in the last few months but uh, is the right uh, is a right op uh, export ban a right policy option or should they have uh, gone for a transparent export tax to recover these input subsidies another uh, policy option is rationalizing the import regime across board by reducing tariffs and duties and one of the good example here is uh, 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 if you have to uh, understand how this policy works is the edible oil prices uh, which have been high in the last almost last one year and for to reduce that government had actually reduced the effective duty in, on crude palm oil from 44% in january 2019 to almost 5.5% in january 2022 and this has been very detrimental in reducing the edible oil uh, especially crude or palm oil inflation in the country but if you look at the import duty on uh, rapeseed and cottonseed oil it's still high around 38% for crude and 49.5% for refined So these are some of the policy action that we can debate in the next session. Uh, what government can do to tame inflation. So that concludes my uh, presentation, and uh, we will be putting some question across for the panel to ponder over. And some of the question is that, as we have discussed earlier, the CPI structure in India is somewhat unique with high weightage of food. So can monetary policy alone tame inflation, or should there be a fiscal consolidation to contain inflationary surge, or what type of fiscal consolidation which will be able to protect growth without uh, without trading off growth? 
and what of trade what sort of trade policy will be help will be uh, should be adopted to bring down the uh, inflationary pressure in the country although these are more more of macroeconomic stances uh, policy stances so to contain inflation in perishable or edible oil or uh, crude oil are there any medium to long term measures to tame inflation thank you that concludes Uh, thank you, Sharma, for a very interesting presentation. Thank you also, Ashok and Deepak, for inviting me to moderate this session. Uh, Ashok and I go back a long time to our days in Delhi School of Economics together, which, he, which is why I think he very wisely put me in the moderator's chair, because he knows that's the only way to shut me up. So I promise I will try to be just seen and not heard. But my panelists have given me the liberty of asking them some questions, maybe. So it'll be a mix of questions and presentations. So DK, I'm not even introducing the panelists, but I think you have the names and details with you. And we have very little time, and I want to follow Deepak's example of closing at 1.30 promptly so that we have a decent lunch. So I will not introduce the speakers, but what I will do is that DK has a presentation, so maybe he will make a short presentation. Ashok and Sitikan, they're both giving me the liberty of asking them some questions, so which is what I will do. And I will follow the order which I have you know, got before me. So I'll start with Sitikanta. And I'll ask him a question and maybe he can take off from there and then tell us, you know, what he would like to speak on. So my question to you, Siti, is that, you know, uh, while I agreed with almost everything that the FM said, which is perhaps not very, you know, normal for most journalists, but I agree with almost everything that she said. But listening to her, I got the sense that, you know, has a space for independent monetary policy in curbing inflation as we know it today. Has that been curved? In fact, listening to her, I got the feeling it reminded me of that movie, you know, Honey, I Shrunk the Kid. So has a space for independent, please mind the words, independent monetary policy shrunk in the light of what we're seeing about the new boost of inflation. Over here. Uh, thank you, Maitri, for asking me the most expected question. And anyway, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Misra, Professor Gulati, Ikriya for uh, conducting this wonderful uh, conference and inviting me and my colleagues from RBA to participate and contribute to the discussions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jose, for a very nice presentation. Um, it's a very humbling experience for me because I'm in the midst of some of the very best in the two panels. I have admired them a lot all my life. So I don't know how much I can contribute, but thank you, Professor Gulati, for giving me this privilege. So I'll try. I'll take this question, which uh, according to me has three parts. Uh, because the question is whether monetary policy alone, given the high share of uh, food and fuel, uh, should take the burden of uh, inflation management. So the first part of the question is uh, whether monetary policy matters. Second, uh, whether monetary policy alone matters. And third thing is given the high share of food and uh, fuel, uh, whether monetary policy can do much in a country like India. Uh, so on the first question, um, um, I can refer easily to the very recent speech in speech by uh, Jerome Powell, Jackson Hole speech. Um, the first of the three lessons that he highlighted is that central banks can and must take the responsibility of price stability. Why can? Because they have the most powerful instrument. And why? They must. Because... That is the only institution which has the mandate to deliver price stability. The second question is whether uh, central banks alone can deliver this or there is a debate. The answer would be yes or no, depending on the nature of inflation. Uh, because the question is essentially ab about price or price stability. And that is the reason why most of the central banks think about soft landing, because your monetary policy is an instrument. If you use it, it will deliver price stability, but you have to sacrifice output. And as Honorable Finance Minister rightly mentioned, because price stability is essentially a subset of overall macro stability or the welfare maximization objective that policies have to do uh, at the macro level. <clears throat> So Dr. Misra told that what are the lessons we can give to the rest of the world. And uh, on this debate on whether India can ensure soft landing, I will cover monetary policy, fiscal policy, and exchange rate policy. Because uh, why I'm covering these three? Because you have to first assess whether we are facing the current inflation because of any policy missteps in the past. And my answer to that is no. I'll start with monetary policy. Many had advocated that there must be automatic monetization of fiscal deficit. 
uh, many, many who had objected earlier, they advocated that after the pandemic, uh, but that was not done in India. Second thing, in RBI didn't dilute its collateral requirements for providing liquidity, which many countries have done. There are discussion that we are copying the Western world, but Western world have given liquidity against toxic assets. RBI has not done that. Third thing, most of the liquidity that were injected, uh, major ones actually, the terminal date was known. So exit was not a very difficult challenge for RBI. And the third thing, last week only in a conference I presented that, um, if inflation is a monetary phenomenon, if you see money growth or money as percentage of GDP, since 2007 financial crisis, it has remained pretty stable around 100. Whereas in Euro area, in US, it has gone to 160, 170. So even the money we say as endogenous, but money growth was always contained. And third thing, after the crisis, because that there was so much of focus on recapitalization and the balance sheet recovery process had started, so as a result of which we had a robust financial system and that financial system, despite large surplus liquidity, didn't give us a credit bubble. So these are the lessons because there are no missteps on the monetary policy side that caused this inflation. Coming to fiscal side, uh, I think Honorable Finance Minister explained it very nicely. Uh, what are the right interventions uh, that must happen from the fiscal side? The first one I would highlight is that despite 6.2% inflation, and uh, the risk that actually monetary policy may fail, uh, the government retained the inflation target and the inflation ban. Again, many had advocated that time that the target should be raised, the ban should be widened. So full credit to the government that it retained the target because it is the prime pillar of macro discipline in economy. The second, I would say that we have never seen before this type of massive fiscal, fiscal level interventions to stabilize prices starting from uh, cereals to pulses to edible oil to fodder. It was massive. There could have been sectoral distortions, but at the aggregate level, I think all the sectoral trade-off costs were made subservient to the overall objective of keeping inflation low. And that is the reason why, even though we had 6.2% average inflation in 2000, uh, 2021, it came down to 5.5%. And most importantly, Food inflation, which was 7.3 in 2020-21, it came down to 4.2% average in 2020-21. And the third aspect, I think, as uh, Dr. Krishnamurti, he also mentioned about that, is the uh, focus on quality of expenditure, which we have never seen before, the government increasing the share of capital expenditure so much. And that is the supply side push, which is certainly going to pay in the long run in terms of stabilizing inflation. The third dimension I would touch upon here is exchange rate. Never we have seen in a crisis that RBI added 135 billion to its foreign, foreign exchange reserves during the two COVID years. And the benefit of that we see now because India's exchange rate is one of the most stable currencies in the world. I think in the previous presentation also it was there. So now I come to the last part of the question, uh, whether because of the high share of uh, food and fuel, um, monetary policy doesn't matter. I would say no. Uh, I would refer here to the recent speech by Hyun Sin. Uh, he has explained that uh, we are not dealing with a situation of movements along the Phillips curve. We are dealing with situations of shifts in the Phillips curve. And he is referring to two types of shifts in the Phillips curve. The first one, you get a supply shock. The supply side could be high commodity prices or a gummed up uh, supply chain. As a result of which, what happens with the same level of slack? or output gap in the economy, you get much higher inflation. And the second level of shift happens because inflation expectations, if they are backward looking, because of high food and fuel inflation, uh, inflation again starts rising. So yes, monetary policy may not have a role directly to bring supply side inflation, but anchoring inflation expectations is absolutely critical. And why this is important, I will again go back to Jerome Powell's recent speech. He said, if there is no price stability, then the economy doesn't work for anyone. So that's why delivering price stability is absolutely critical. And second thing, he also talked about rational inattention. That means when you have delivered price stability, people don't discuss about inflation. They devote their time for something more sensible and useful. But if you allow inflation to remain high for long, then everybody starts discussing and that 
creates the risk of wage price spiral. That is very difficult to contain. And the last point that I will make here on this is that uh, I think the report on currency finance highlighted that. So if our share is high, food and fuel, whether we can still deliver price stability. Uh, I would say that structurally Indian economy has changed. We are a net surplus country, even though there are sectoral imbalances. In agriculture or palm produce, we have net surplus. We are a net exporting country now. And uh, what assessment we did is that if food inflation deviates, if it goes above 6%, for how many months it remains above 6%? So food per se, 76% of the time in our data so far, actually comes back to the band 76% of the time. If, if that coincides with a favorable commodity price cycle or oil price cycle, then 95% of the time actually it comes back to. So there are two items. One is pulses and edible oil. So if they go out of 6%, then for 24 months to 30 months, they remain above 6%. And I think government has recognized that. I think policy side situation has improved a lot. And I think uh, because of the targeted palm oil mission, hopefully that also will be addressed going ahead. So I would conclude by saying that, uh, yes, monetary policy clearly matters. But as uh, Honorable Finance Minister mentioned, in a country like ours, I think uh, a synchronized approach to inflation management, the way it has been in managing the pandemic, that is the best. And that is also the best relation to the international community. And most of the international investors, when they come to India, they not only thank the government for retaining the inflation target, but also the exceptional coordination they have seen between monetary authority and fiscal authority, both in managing the pandemic and now also in managing inflation. I'll stop here. Thank you. But it depends on the Reserve Bank of India's monetary policy, I must say. But with that, it's over to you, DK. And DK, I know you, you would like to say or have some thoughts, but I can just focus a little bit on whether even the new thing is, is inflation structural, is it cyclical, transient and permanent, permanent are now out of fashion, now it's cyclical and it's structural. And one more thing is that, you know, uh, that if inflation is going to be long term, as long as people seem to suggest, then should the remedies also be given? Over to you. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Gulati uh, and Dr. Mishra for inviting me to this wonderful conference. It was really, I think, uh, quite charged uh, previous session. And so what I'm going to do is, uh, I think, try to address what uh, the difficult question which she's asked, uh, Matsuri has asked. But before that, I think we've uh, talked so much about food inflation, 45.9%. We should not forget that that is 11, 12 weight. Things have changed. I mean, so the if you you need to rework the weights of uh, of, of the index. I mean, so the, you get so you measure inflation correctly. If you don't measure it, how will you monitor it and how will you control it? So I think the, the it's due that we we start reworking the, the inflation weights. I think that's very important. I'm pretty sure weight, food weight of food has come down. I think as it has been coming down over the years. Uh, the second is I think the the uh, uh, inflation uh, peaked. Uh, uh, Almost, I think I can say that with some confidence now, although we do expect the August data, which will come out on Monday to be a little sticky. It won't be, I think it will be around 6.9, that's our forecast. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight the fact that the inflation decline that we have seen, uh, and I think we've already talked about a lot of that, is largely because of the uh, fortuitous mix of, uh, I mean, the uh, what the global developments are, which is we saw how sharply the uh, edible oil price has come down and also commodity prices have come down. So that has helped to some extent. On top of that, the supply, not discounting the supply side measures which uh, government was taking to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to reduce the, uh, the, the pressure on inflation. Now, I think uh, we've talked about food, uh, but we haven't talked so much about core, which is when you take the food out and the, the, uh, the fuel out, what is left is the core inflation. And what we, if you see the developments in core inflation, there was a massive supply shock, very sharp increase in commodity prices. And despite demand being weak, the economy was, uh, private consumption was the slowest to recover uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in 21, 22. Suddenly it has moved up now. 
uh, the, despite weak demand, we saw very high core inflation. And that's the reason was that the, the input price increases were so sharp uh, that, that the, the uh, uh, producers had no option but to pass it on as much as they could. So there was a pressure on core inflation, which remained while the economy was weak. Now the recent GDP data shows that the demand has, private consumption has picked up. So now the pressure to, uh, to pass it on to the end consumer will be even higher. But now we have a situation where, uh, where uh, the, uh, the global prices are coming down, but still because of the demand, we will see the core inflation remaining sticky. Now, in, what I would say is that in the first part of inflation control, uh, what came into play was the supply side measures of the government. Now, I think the RBI's actions, which, uh, which is raising interest rates, that will curb demand and will curb the pass through. So that's how I see the coordination between the, 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 the supply side measures. So they haven't, they don't act simultaneously. Monetary policy takes about uh, three to four quarters for it to have an impact on growth and also on inflation. So you can't say that this inflation decline is, maybe expectations have played some role, but I don't think they have played that dominant role right now. So that was, that was one part. And then, so I think this also addresses uh, to some extent the cyclicality uh, that you were, you were referring to. Uh, the other point I want to make uh, very quickly on the, uh, on, the, on the food side, I know Dr. Gulat is there. I, I, I think I've learned a lot, lot of uh, uh, agriculture uh, economics from him. So uh, I don't want to uh, uh, preempt what he's going to say, but the point I wanted to make was that within food inflation, uh, there is a part which, is, which we don't control, which is the weather which now is dominantly climate. Climate uh, issues, as Dr. Gulati was saying, are becoming predominant. Actually, even in the European Central Bank, they're talking about raising inflation target. The discussion has begun. Because of the climate effects, the inflation is going to go up. So my question is, can you have a 4% uh, inflation target on a sustainable basis? Uh, can you maintain that when there is a upside risk to food inflation from factors you don't, you don't control? So now what do you do in this situation? Uh, there are also factors which you can control within food inflation. There, is a, there, is a, there are a lot of artificial man-made costs, I think like uh, the, the structure of the mandis, uh, some of these are getting addressed. Then there is also when the food moves from the farm gate to the, to the fork, there is a lot of inefficiency that, that plays out. And we, we often hear of, uh, of, of, uh, of of high pressure on uh, on food uh, food uh, vegetable prices, which are extremely volatile, uh, the the standard deviation of uh, of vegetable uh, inflation is ten times that, or uh, not five times that of uh, of 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 cereals. So there is extreme volatility also. So there is need to uh, need to smoothen that, and for that I think the food processing etc. are very very critical at this juncture because a lot of food gets wasted. I mean let's uh, let's. Uh, uh, there are many studies. I think Crystal also did some study on tomatoes a few years back and found that uh, one third of the tomato gets wasted in, in the supply chain itself. Uh, and there are other vegetables also. So I think addressing those issues, even sorting at the simple solutions like sorting at the farm gate or, and grading it will ensure that the wastages uh, come down because if you have a basket with uh, with with, uh, with some tomatoes rotten it's very likely that by the time it reaches the 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 end consumer more tomatoes will get rotten because of that so there are various uh, micro adjustments that can be done but what i was trying to highlight is that since the wastage part happens in the supply chain you need to address that i think that is that is akin to improving supply at a time when I think the, the supply will face pressure from the weather and from climate. So let me stop there. Thank you so much, Vicky, for being so, so very disciplined in your time management. I think we will spill over just maybe a minute or two, but I'll now move over to Ashima, who's joining us on the left. Ashima, I would like you to address this basically two questions. I don't know whether you heard Rakesh Mohan in you know, the free coffee break session. He said, inflation management is much more difficult than inflation targeting. So that's whenever the uh, monetary policy slips up. Does it leave the ball in the, you know, in management spot, which is more in the government spot? That is my first question to you. And my second question is that Rani Dua made this statement that inflation cycles can be predicted and can be modeled like business cycles. So her point was that actually central banks failed in their modeling. Two questions. 
So A, do you believe they can be modeled? And do you believe economic models are fallible or infallible? Over to you. Thank you, Maithili. And I will join the others in thanking uh, Ashok and uh, Deepak for this invitation. A very timely kind of topic and to have this broad range of people, policymakers, academics, addressing it is to, you know, the very frank uh, talk by the, uh, by the finance minister is extremely useful. So I will, um, I will, I will start by just addressing this puzzle. You know, it's, it's related to your question on inflation management and inflation targeting. I think one reason the issue being taken up in the earlier section was that India has surprised everyone, A, by growing faster than expected. I mean, without so much of a growth fall in the pandemic, despite double shocks. And also inflation is lower than elsewhere in the world, which is unprecedented. So uh, one of the things that the pandemic has brought out is that it's important to pay attention to the supply side. And in India, the supply side was always important. I think the finance minister emphasized that. That's a broader inflation management issue. What the government did through the pandemic was limited fiscal stimulus, well targeted, using the financial sector, which was stable and well capitalized after a decade of reform, and also well coordinated with monetary policy. The latter had space for reversal of tightening after uh, partly due to this continuous supply side reform, you know, spending on Mondays, building roads, decreasing logistics costs, apart from intervention in food uh, management itself, all this decreases costs and therefore inflation over time. I think another reason India surprised us, so there's no conflict between inflation targeting and inflation management. Inflation targeting is a part of inflation management. I'll just come to that. Another reason that India surprised us is I think that we reach a level of income and we're naturally very diverse in many ways, but economic diversity also. So if there's some areas where growth is contracting, like in the pandemic, agriculture did well, though industry had you know, the initial lockdown. So we have certain counteracting forces that moderate. So this part sign of maturity that shocks don't affect the total so much. And the other point is that in, in macroeconomics context is very, very important. The US gave a huge fiscal stimulus, partly because after the global financial crisis, recovery was very slow. And the academic debate said that there was inadequate fiscal stimulus. So they obliged this time. But they forgot to pay attention that in a pandemic, the supply side is also affected. And if you're giving so much money to people, and it's going to add to the snarls in, in supply chains, et cetera, et cetera. And also to contrast this with India's experience in 2011, where again, there was very large fiscal expenditure after the global financial crisis, when global and domestic food prices were rising. Now we've all seen that food has a very large share in the consumption basket. And there we saw second round effects, rural wages, real wages were growing almost in double digits, unprecedented in India. So you had, um, you know, widespread and entrenched inflation. This time, because of the partly because of the provision of free food and because of better supply side movement, which is reduced food inflation and its size in the whole whole complex, um, rural real wage growth is slightly negative. Rural nominal wage growth is flat. So unlike the U.S., we need to emphasize this. There are no labor market pressures, no second round effects. So inflation is persistent because of multiple supply shocks, pandemic waves, then Ukraine and so on. And therefore it's the, the requirement for demand compression, which is what fiscal and monetary policy can do, canonical or traditional monetary fiscal policy is that much less. Then the other question of crude, uh, of uh, WPI inflation being much higher than CPI. Here, uh, the issue is we've done some work because in India, normally the causality is from WPI to CPI. But in India, because of the importance of food and food in, in wages and second round pass through, and food is a larger size in CPI, the causality is from CPI to WPI. So as Siti was uh, um, reporting on some research, food normally comes back to core, not that core is going to rise with headline. Yeah? So uh, it, that, for that reason, and also the government excise tools, because 
excise not just for CPI. WPI has risen so much because international prices have risen, but the excise cut in oil reduces CPI inflation. And then we have that all this time we've been waiting, but now we are seeing a global slowdown, the promise of uh, supply bottlenecks easing. Finally, something we are seeing a reduction in commodity prices. And this is going to be beneficial for India, although there are question marks on energy because of the ongoing Ukraine war, et cetera. So although we don't need traditional demand compression, but we do need a reversal of pandemic time, huge repo rate cuts. They were exceptional for an exceptional time. That means that the real interest rate can be too negative, which can increase, overheat the economy. So therefore this front loading of repo rise that the MPC has done is, was very required, was highly required. And that keeps the real rate somewhat near neutral. You know, unlike the last decade, when first it was highly negative then highly positive, and that badly affected growth. So if the real rate is less than the growth rate, the real rate is low and growth is high, then that is the best for fiscal consolidation. That was another issue which came up. Shankar Acharya always emphasizes fiscal consolidation. So the denominator rises with growth and the fiscal situation improves as tax revenue, et cetera, rise. So then to come to this question of predicting inflation. So when headline is the main uh, inflation you're trying to anchor, it's very difficult to predict because of the volatility of food, tomato, potatoes, and so on. I think RBI talks to Ashok and many other agricultural economists, but they've not been able to you know, you suddenly you have parval prices going up in the northeast and all those kinds of things. So, uh, but uh, but uh, I think that the non-traditional pass through of the Reserve Bank, the inflation targeting and anchoring inflation expectations, we are seeing that household uh, inflation expectations, though they are naive, when there was an excise cut, there's a sharp fall. So, and overall, because inflation is high and volatile, a lot of attention paid to what the authorities are saying, and it does affect people's expectations. But here I would like to ask Ashok to comment on this when he speaks after this, because when we talk about anchoring inflation expectations, what is very important is that regulators have to internalize this also. If you are in an inflation targeting economy with a target of 4%, you cannot have food prices rising every year at 8%. You know, or if there's an oil spike, it should be reversed, like in the rest of the world. In India, it tends to be a ratchet. Certain certain prices rise, the CACP raises MSP, then it never falls. You have the farm lobbies that get in. There's this link to export prices. In fact, that recently, Indian before the rise in world wheat prices, Indian prices were at border prices. And then farmers were asking for protection. So the point is that if commodity prices rise, they have to fall whether it's electricity prices, the kind of price increases you are giving. If you are, now we have a Kirat Parikh committee for gas, then I was going to, you know, this is an issue that you have to consider that you cannot give a commodity price rise, which is much higher than the average price rise in the inflation because anchoring expectations means markets, households, regulators, administered prices. So, and there's another question on long-term, what can you do? to reduce inflation. So inflation anchoring appropriate demand management in relation to supply and uh, regulators have to also internalize that 4%. Yeah. And then of course, continual supply side reforms, improvement in productivity. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rashima. And I think Ashok, it's over to you the last speaker now for this session. And we just passed time, so maybe we can wrap up in just two, three minutes. Sorry to do that, I to rush you. But uh, I'm also going to talk at the beginning that there's no magic wand to get inflation under control. But we're going to keep almost all the bandwidth. You also need to suggest that you surveyed your food basket in the CPI, logically, you know, with reason. And you know, great restaurants, there are a number. So is that the answer? Well, that's one structural thing that you need to get right. Right information, right analysis, right policy. If you don't have the right information, your analysis can be misleading and therefore your policy is done. So that's the first thing. We are already very, very late in that game. Uh, my feeling is we are definitely below 40%, maybe anywhere between 35 to 40%. So that's number one. But I think 
there were two, three things that came on the table, and Ashma also uh, asked me to respond to some of those things. I said, we are not too busy. You know, we have to distinguish between psychical behavior of crisis, which uh, Pamit Yaw was indicating, and I do believe in agriculture there are cycles of five years, six years, and then goes up. So we need to understand that better so that when they are in the downstream, what policy measures are needed, and when they are in the upstream, immediately there has to be triggers identified to get the policy action quickly in place. And I'll give you one little example. Edible oils. We know it's an imported inflation because 55 to 60 percent of India's consumption of edible oil is imported. We were looking at the prices were going up and up and up and up in the international market, and we had a tariff of 40 percent plus. What are we doing? Why did we keep 40 percent tariff? That was when the prices were, you know, 70 percent below that level, 60 percent below that level. So there was no trigger, and it took a lot of negotiations with RBI even that please convince the finance ministry to bring that down quickly to 5%. We were late in that, but we gained from that. Still, Madam in the morning, finance minister said that we have a very calibrated trade policy. Commodities which we don't produce, we can bring down the tariffs quickly, but commodities that we produce, mustard oil, within that, the tariff is still at 40% plus in refined is 50% plus. That's where the balancing act between the producer and the consumers is. That's the political economy. The policy makers are walking on a very tight rope. And that brings me to the issue before I come to MSP. Now, this thing has to be uh, distinguished from what is some abrupt change because of climate rainfall. I mentioned in the morning about tomatoes. Manish, can you stand up, please? He monitors literally every day 299 commodities, what is happening on the prices chart. And when we looked at the June figures, tomato price, 158% inflation and 8% plus contribution to overall CPI, which was the highest, nobody had expected. So we wrote a little piece of a tomato humbles RBI. They have no clue how to tackle this because neither monetary policy will be beneficial, nor fiscal policy, nor even trade policy. So you have only medium to long-term what uh, BK was saying about food processing. 10% of our perishable commodities need to be processed, whether it is onion. I was reminded of onion during Vajpayee's time. The government literally was dethroned just because of onion price. And what we don't know is you have to dehydrate onion and use that processed material, which will help the farmer when there is a bumper harvest and then help the consumer when the fresh prices go up because of one reason or the other and the shelf life is much more. So those are the medium to long-term policies. Government is inching towards that, but somewhat slow. Last comment I want to make to Atashima ordered him to say something on MSP, why MSP keeps increasing by 7, 8% every year. I think we have been able to control food inflation relatively better for two reasons. Look at urea prices, which normally used to be below $300 a ton, went all the way up to $900, $925 a ton in the international market. And we are importing about 30% fertilizer. For the farmer, the urea price remained constant throughout this period. It was absorbed into the fiscal deficit, it will be reflected, but it gets distributed. Otherwise, Ashima, if we had increased the fertilizer prices by even 10%, 20%, 40%, besides the chaos on the roads, 
uh, by the farmers, you would have to increase the MSP because you are locked in by law, literally, that we will give 50% uh, profit over A2 plus ML uh, cost of production. So I think now getting out of that once this government has already committed to that type of a thing, uh, the only way out was absorb that shock of increased cost is somewhere else and let it get distributed over the economy. Second thing which she herself mentioned, which is the biggest uh, welfare scheme, I would say more than three lakh crores this year, and that was the free food to more than 800 million people. Now, 800 million people getting 10 kg per person per month, uh, you know, now whether that is right or wrong, we can discuss and debate separately, but that has helped keep the basic staple prices somewhat under the top, despite global prices going up and despite even when the you know, exports uh, were filling up the prices. So to me, at the end, I would say one little thing. He came very aggressively in defense of RBI. Yes, monetary policy is important. We do agree with that. Whether that's the only Brahmastra that can control inflation, I beg to differ. And I would move more into the macroeconomic policy and what the Honorable Finance Minister herself said, that fiscal policy. I think we have gone very loose on the fiscal policy, much more loose on fiscal policy than on monetary policy that we have been following. And that has been more into the structural factor over a period of time. But trade policy and agro-processing policy needs to be dovetailed with it. We don't have figures for trade policy to act quickly. We don't have any cohesive thing on the food processing thing to you know, smoothen out all these uh, fluctuations and prices. And lastly, I do appreciate she brought on the table very important things, and that is the infrastructure. And agriculture infrastructure particularly can bring down the price levels because we have very high logistics. So efficiency will be brought in. At the end of the story, we have to increase our productivity. That's the only way to bring down the real prices of agriculture and reduce the Component of agriculture in India. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashok. And I'm afraid we have already done this over time, so I really cannot give any time for question answers to the audience, which I would have loved to do. But clearly, it's going to be very difficult to tame this multifaceted beast. And I think the panelists are going to have to keep the study up for the mind. We'll have to see what Deepak offers us out there. Thank you very much. That was an excellent discussion. I would like to thank the panel for sharing valuable inputs. We will incorporate them in our study. May I now request Dr. Ashok Gulati to give his concluding remarks and vote of thanks. Well, only two minutes I will take. I'll not stand between you and the lunch. I think we are extremely grateful, Ikriya, in particular, on behalf of Deepak and myself and the entire Ikriya, we are grateful that the Honorable Minister spent ample time with us, more than what we had expected. And she gave us a very comprehensive view, going much beyond the monetary policy story. And that was a good insight. I think we need to digest that and look at our entire toolbox of controlling policies. My next thanks comes to our excellent speakers, the panelists from Shankaracharya on to Siti and DK here. It's amazing to see the experience and definitely looking at that. Yes, there could be some lessons from the West, but we have our own unique way of adopting and crafting our own policies and in both perhaps in the financial crisis of 7-8. And now, I think we have done somewhat better than many of our peers in both cases. So there is something ingenious about ourselves. We look, but we also uh, craft our own things. 
So that's something great and grateful to the panelists who gave the insights into that. Lastly, the moderators. I think this is great because moderating is an art and thanks uh, for tapping into my old social capital with you. Of course, Deepak uh, did an excellent job uh, in getting the best out of our uh, top panelists. To all the audience who are joining here and online, we had more than 450 registrations, so there are a lot of people listening. I think all of this will be on YouTube. It was already live. You can watch it later also. And uh, uh, grateful to all of you. My apologies that we did not have enough time for question answer from your side. So apologies for that, but the debate must go on. And lastly, my young people here who did a lot of work till night and day, and were working on the presentations and other uh, logistics and congratulations to both the presenters and the entire team that has been working very hard on that. Thank you very much. We'll be honored if you join us for lunch. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today on